Welcome, dear listeners, to Horror Den of Misfits. And now, Story Time. A couple months ago, I was camping out of my mom and stepdad's RV camper on VLM land in Nevada. Where I was parked was about 20 miles from any houses or anything. While I was out there, I got snowed in. It was about three feet of snow so I sent out a message to my mom telling her what was going on. That day I spent digging snow out from around the RV so that I felt like I was doing something. I spent the whole day out there digging snow out. As the sun was going down I had about a 25 square foot section from around the door, I was using a spade, it was very slow going, and a path that led about 80 feet. I was at the end of the path still digging when the sun went down. I decided to work a little more and while I was digging I heard what sounded like someone walking through the snow. I looked up and there was a figure of a pretty tall guy ahead of me coming out of the tree line about 200 feet from me. If I had to guess I would say about 6 foot 5 or so. Anyway, he was trudging through the snow towards me. Considering that we were in very cold weather and very far from anyone or anywhere my first thought was oh crap, this guy needs help so I called out to him hey, you okay out here? And as soon as I finished that sentence the figure broke into a full blown sprint. I immediately turned around and sprinted down the path back to my RV. When I got to the door I looked back and this man had not only crossed the clearing through three feet of snow but he was now sprinting down the path I had dug. I got into the RV, slammed the door and locked it behind me. I grabbed my gun and moved to the back side of the RV. I could hear the man circling my RV so I shouted I have a gun, if you don't leave now I will shoot you after I yelled that there was two or three insanely loud bang sounds on the side of the RV. I heard the man start walking toward the front end but I couldn't hear past that. I stayed in the bathroom at the rear of the RV and ended up falling asleep. In the morning I woke up and I took the gun and went outside. I could see paths leading from the tree like, circling my RV, and back out to the tree line. I also learned what those loud bangs were. The generator cover on the RV was kicked in. I recently told my friend about what happened to me up there because he said he is planning on going up there for the weekend and when I finished the story he told me to post it here. Before I begin, I want to clarify that I'm a 16-year-old male. About three years ago, I was in Virginia visiting my family over the summer. We were right outside the D.C. area and staying in a two-story house near the freeway. On the other side of the freeway was a forest, so my mom, her boyfriend Eric, and I were all staying with Eric's parents. We had brought some night vision binoculars and decided that tonight was the perfect time to use them. So after dinner, we geared up and headed out. We passed under the freeway and headed into the woods. When we got about five minutes into the forest, we set down our bag and took out our binoculars. My mom looked around with them for quite a while, seeing a few squirrels here and there. She got tired of them and eventually passed them on to me. I looked around for a while, being careful not to look at the freeway for fear of being blinded. I spotted something behind a tree, about 50 feet to our left. I concentrated on it, trying to figure out what it was. It looked like a pale, bald, anorexic man looking straight at us from behind a tree. I felt a bit uneasy, but I was hesitant to believe it was really there. I asked Eric to take a look just in case. To my despair, he saw it too and described it much the same way I did. Now. Eric is a former amateur boxer, and I trained MM almost every day, but neither one of us wanted to stick around with that thing. We started heading back to the house, crossing under the freeway. We took another look behind us as a car came by, and all three of us saw glowing eyes lit up by the headlights on the other side of the freeway. We said, F that, and headed back to the house. When we got back, Eric's parents were asleep and my mom and Eric went upstairs to the guest room. There was only one guest room, so I had the couch downstairs. I was a little too excited after seeing the thing in the woods, 
so I ended up staying up all night. Around 3 a.m., I was watching TV, and I started hearing footsteps above me. I immediately remembered our earlier encounter, and I panicked a little. I tried to calm down and tell myself it was just one of the dogs or maybe someone who couldn't sleep. However, I kept hearing the footsteps for a while, actually, until I heard a doorknob jiggle. I found it weird that they were trying to open a locked door, but I tried to ignore it. They stopped walking around for a few more minutes, and then it was quiet again. I stayed up until the sun started coming up, and then I passed out. My mom woke me up, and I remembered the footsteps from the night before. I described what happened and asked if one of them got up at any time. She said no, and I thought it must have been one of the dogs. That is until she told me the room above me is the office, no one was in the office, and the door stays locked at night. My heart sank as I pieced it all together. I don't know if it was that thing for sure, but I think it was. I've done a lot of research since then, trying to figure out what that was that night. I found two creatures that seemed to match it. I think it was either a skinwalker or possibly a windigo. Whichever one it was, I'm just thankful that door was locked because I know I wouldn't be able to fight that thing no matter how tough I am. So I was talking to my buddy today and he told me a story that happened to him around September of last year. He was driving around 9.30 to 10 at night on a kind of secluded road in a suburb by the city of Huntsville. There are woods on both sides of this road. As he was driving, he thinks he sees a deer heading towards him. As he sees it more clearly, it turns out it's on two legs, has antlers, and is running towards him. He nopes the F out of there. He told me he hasn't driven down that road since then. What do you guys think this could be? I doubt it could be a skinwalker or a windigo, as it's just too far south. I don't know of any legends around North Alabama that match his description. My buddy said he'll sketch it for me in about an hour, so once he does I'll update the post with the sketch. I grew up in Northern California and my family would often go camping in the Tahoe area, Shasta area and in the San Juan Islands in Washington. We weren't avid campers but we would often spend a week or two in the woods in campgrounds or on BLM land. Once I was a teenager I would bring friends along with us and we would set up a separate campsite a few hundred feet away for some privacy. This particular incident happened in the Mount Shasta area when I was around 14 years old. We were on state or BLM land I'm not sure which but it was not a proper campsite by any means. My parents decided to rent a small RV with enough space for them to sleep in knowing we would set up our own camp anyways. After setting up camp and sharing dinner with the family, they turned in and my two buddies and I walked back to our area and started up the campfire. One of my friends had smuggled a few cigarettes which we choked on and pretended to get high from. Around 12.30 or so we decided to go to our large six-plus person tent and settle in for the night. We were in an open field with no trees around us for around 75 yards. There was a dry riverbed on one end of the field and my parents had their RV parked in the woods on the other side. We laid in our sleeping bags unable to fall asleep, talking about the hot girls at our school and making jokes. Around 2 a.m. we were quieting down and basically asleep watching some family guy on one of our phones when we heard a rattling sound outside the tent. It sounded like a very sick person with a really bad cough trying to breathe. I looked at my friends who bolted awake in their sleeping bags. One of them reached for a flashlight but froze when he heard the rattling breathing sound right behind him. The rattling started to circle the tent rapidly only making a slight sound as it ran through the grass. It was moving far too fast to be a human and didn't have the weight to its footsteps that a bear or larger canine would have. Eventually the rattling turned to panting and the creature walked a bit away from the tent and seemed to settle in not far off. My most courageous friend decided to get up and check it out so he carefully opened the tent to pop his head out. As soon as his head was completely out of the flap, 
The panting and rattling sound stopped completely leaving an uncanny silence you could almost taste. I whispered to my friend asking what is it? But he waved his hand in a shut up motion. After a minute or two we heard a deep growl and hissing sound and my friend jumped back and instantly zipped up the tent. He dove into his sleeping bag and covered his head, and my friend and I came closer to quietly ask what he saw. The growling stopped but we could tell the animal was still nearby. My friend refused to speak to us other than saying its eyes. While never removing his head from his bag. We must have fallen asleep at some point and when we woke up around 7 am the friend who had poked his head out of the tent was gone. We went outside to find him staring at the coals of the fire with a glazed expression on his face. He only responded to us with one word answers for the rest of the trip and I'm not sure if he slept at all. A few weeks after the trip he came over to my house, hugged me and just sobbed. He was uncontrollably crying and shaking and speaking unintelligibly. I sat him down and brought him a Gatorade, he pulled himself together and I asked what was going on. What he told me stuck with me, but the way he told me I will never forget. With an almost trance-like way of speaking he said I haven't slept more than one hour a night since I saw that thing. He won't leave me alone and I think he's going to kill me he started crying again and I asked him what did you see? Who is he? He told me with a shaky voice it was a dog twice as tall as me, standing on its hind legs. It had a grin on its face and red eyes that almost looked like they glowed in the moonlight. He growled at me while looking me dead in the eyes and then sat down like you and I would on a chair. He wasn't growling though, he was laughing. I didn't really believe him but because of how shaken up he was I just sat there and told him nothing was coming for him. When my mom got home she thought my friend was physically ill because of the look on his face, and called his parents at home. They picked him up and told us he had not slept through the night since they got back and that they were going to the doctors in the morning. He stayed home from the first few days of our summer camp but finally came, but he was sedated because of the medication he was on. He seemed like he was only half with us during the day, and right after dinner he would take three or four pills and pass out. We stayed friends and he eventually got off the pills but I never spoke with him about that night again. He works as an army ranger now and I only see him once a year around the holidays. He was always the funny, loud one growing up but now he had become a somewhat reclusive and mysterious person when he was home. He doesn't have a wife or kids and I don't think he wants to. I hope that creature doesn't bother him anymore. As a teenager, my friends and I used to do all sorts of stupid things to scare each other or to try and contact spirits or ghosts and whatnot. If we saw it on TV, we tried to find it or summon it, to say the least. You know, the typical just messing around kind of things that teenagers do. One night, we were out on my friend's pool deck behind his house. He has this one acre plot behind his place that is a small field. The grass was only grown up maybe a foot because it was just getting into spring, and the snow had been gone maybe a month. We were just goofing off out back, and he was trying to spook my sister and me that he saw a Bigfoot out back in the field. He said his mom saw it and had this whole elaborate story about how it was just chilling on his garden bench in his yard. After a while, he brought us down into the yard, and it was really dark by this time to show us where he had seen it and to sit on the bench and reenact the way this Bigfoot creature was sitting on this bench. We get down there, and he is showing us, then we start to hear movement in the grass a little ways out. We were a little spooked because he was trying to scare us with the Bigfoot thing, but we all decided it was probably his cat Kit, so we started calling to the cat, and the movement stopped. We brushed it off and went back up onto the back deck, and there is his cat at the back sliding door, just sitting there watching us. I got a little nervous, but they just laughed it off and said it was probably the neighbor's cat, which would explain why it didn't come over to us. We sat and chatted for a bit, then my sister and I decided we were going to go home because it was getting really late, and we didn't want to get in trouble. Just as we were getting up from the patio chairs, I noticed something out of the corner of my eye at the grass line near a skinny tree. I froze, seeing as I was already paranoid, 
and I got their attention. At first, they didn't see it until it moved, and you could see the gleam off its eyes from the deck light. At first, my sister thought it was a cat or a raccoon or something ducking in the grass, but as we all moved more to pick up and go inside, it moved slowly along the grass line. I hurried them to look, and there was another one coming out from behind another group of trees, and the one in the foreground of the grass, you could tell it wasn't a cat. It was hunched down and didn't have cat-like ears or a tail. It did have a tail, though, and it was thin. This thing was the size of a cat but looked more like a reptile, but not really reptilian either. It's really hard to explain. The closest photo I have ever seen is this one where there was a couple, I think in a wedding photo, under a tree, and the demon was in the tree. It actually reminds me of the popular Jersey Devil photo, but not really, since mine didn't have ears or wings. My name is Jessica, I'm a 34-year-old woman from Ohio. I have three kids, two boys, and a girl, as well as a dog and a husband. We've been married for 12 years. I work as a receptionist at a dental office. I consider myself pretty average, with nothing extraordinary about me, except for the story I'm about to tell you. It all happened in Ohio, close to Germantown but not in Germantown. It was dusk on September 20, 2003. I was coming home from visiting my parents. My dad had a near miss with some medical issues, and two weeks prior, he had surgery. Visiting them daily was something I was doing at that point. Back then, I didn't have any kids yet, and I was just starting to date my now husband. I was about 30 minutes away from home on this back road when it happened. The road was curvy, and since it was starting to get dark, I was going slower than usual. The sun was glaring in my eyes, and I was looking for my sunglasses right before it happened. As I was looking for my sunglasses, I noticed a big mess on the shoulder of the road. Initially, I thought it was just a bush, but as I got closer, I realized it was an animal. At first glance, it looked like a bear due to its thick and shaggy coat. We don't have many bears in Ohio, but there are a few small populations in our state. I was excited at the thought of seeing a bear in the wild, but as I focused more, I realized it wasn't a bear. It was crouched down in an unusual way, almost human-like. When it looked up at me, I saw its canine features, a long muzzle, big pointy ears, and reflective eyes. The creature snarled, revealing its giant teeth. It had a long bushy tail, and despite sitting differently from animals, it had a human quality about it. Suddenly, it stood up on two legs, towering over me at least eight feet tall. It had muscles upon muscles, long arms with clawed hands, and dark, shaggy hair. The creature's stance reminded me of how canines stand, but it looked more human than any animal should. It pivoted on one foot, grabbed a mangled deer, and casually walked off into the woods. I was terrified, shivering, and unable to move. It was like staring at an honest-to-God werewolf. When I got back to my parents' house, I was speechless and visibly scared. I babbled about seeing a werewolf, and even though my parents couldn't make sense of everything, they knew I was genuinely frightened. They later mentioned strange howling noises they sometimes hear around the property, like something out of this world. To this day, I avoid driving down that road unless it's in broad daylight. I've never seen that creature again, but the encounter left me hyper aware of my surroundings, especially near that road. I never want to experience something like that again, but I also see closure and understanding of what I saw that day. Thank you for listening and providing a platform for sharing these stories. It's a reminder that sometimes, the unexpected and inexplicable can happen, even to ordinary people like me. I had just recently got back from a camping trip with my girlfriend earlier this week near the small town of Rimforest, California, just a few miles from Lake Arrowhead. 
It was my girlfriend's first camping experience ever and it will certainly go down in the books as quite an experience as this trip has prompted me to share with you guys our story. Now, I'm no expert camper but I'd like to think that I've been on enough trips, perhaps the bare minimum, to at least somewhat not resemble an idiot out in the wild against the odds. I used to enjoy camping with my family back in my younger years but in retrospect, all those trips were really tame compared to even the most mundane expeditions my friends back in grade school would embark on during summer vacation. Bug spray. Sunscreen. Hats and sunglasses. Campfires. Lanterns. Portable stoves and electric heaters. Sure, we had no RV or trailer but we had all the inner workings to exist comfortably externally and all the makings of a grand old time. All that being said, I can tell you for a fact that a resurgence of overzealous nostalgic joy overcame me when my girlfriend asked if I wanted to go camping with her this week. But even with all my trips back in my youth, nothing prepared me for what I experienced in Rimforest, California. We left for our trip early at noon. A two-day getaway, just my girlfriend, me, and our dog. I'd been needing a break from my everyday life and she, she was all done with her finals. We had planned for our trip a week prior and had taken care of all the necessary shopping in true millennial fashion via the internet. Excited we were, as we made our steady climb in her Prius up the winding roads to Lake Arrowhead with enough vigor to rival even that of the little engine that could. Armed with one bar of signal, we reached the campground moments before our cell service gave in. We had stopped at an empty post at the entrance to the campground when we had noticed a peculiar sign on the service window, Camp Hosts Watching Grounds. Without thinking much of it, we grab a few maps from the kiosk and proceed to let ourselves in. The place was real quaint. About 120 to 140 campsites and only 15 of them currently being rented. It was a little unexciting on the scenic side of things but we couldn't complain, it was cheap and we were allowed to bring our dog. When we arrived at our site, we were pleased to see we at least had one neighbor to keep us company in the event of total isolation when night approaches, a middle-aged couple with an armada of big dogs. Not the mean, ferocious type, though I am a lover of all dogs, mind you but the kind that would just give you that lackadaisical head tilt and pass only a complete, careless glance if you so happen to make eye contact with them. What nice dogs they have, says my girlfriend. And what a nice campground we chose. Save for the neighboring RV, it was just us in the wild, in the wild, and we couldn't have asked for anything more. After taking it all in, we hastily unloaded our car only to run into our first problem, setting up the tent. Now again, I like to think I'm not an idiot, as I guess I can say now the only camping I've done without my parents was Coachella 2015 and a wilderness sabbatical with some friends in the desert that same year so. I've at least set up two tents in my life. Nothing too intense that I can't handle, hey. The tent setup actually went off without a hitch, it was just one stake proved to be a little too hard to hammer. A half hour after pitching the tent, the final stake had uprooted itself from the ground, causing the wireframes to jolt. But with much deliberation and a little help from some all-natural paperweights provided to us by the great outdoors, we planted that sucker right back into the earth and it hasn't budged since. By this point, my girl decides it's high time we cook some lunch and as we get to it, an old couple on a golf cart approaches the both of us. Why hello there. The elderly woman greets us. Are you here with a reservation? As a matter of fact, we are. Says my girl. Since we spent quite a while pitching our tent, I decide to use the restroom. I figure my girlfriend would speak to them as she made our reservations so I made a break for the restroom and came back just as the camp host was going over the last of the ground rules. What a cute dog you have by the way. Be sure to keep it on a leash at all times. Oh. She doesn't tend to get far away from me, she gets separation anxiety. It's just for safety, the elderly man finally speaks up, correcting his spectacles as he chuckles. Wouldn't want her to get snatched up by something now, would ya? He says with a smile. We'll keep her leashed, I reply. 
Funny I didn't think too much of that sign from the post at the entrance in the beginning. And a little funnier how all the previous no sleep entries I've read in the past about forest rangers, goatmen, windigos, and other strange happenings in the woods all caught up to me that moment. My girlfriend fancies the twilight zone but one no sleep story really did a number on her so I know any mention of this sort would land me in the doghouse for sure. That was pretty weird, my girl says under her breath, as the hosts were off in their golf cart. What, the last? Thing they said? Yeah. Well, let's just keep her leashed and keep a close eye on her. Don't think about it too much, sugar. Let's go make lunch. The trip was panning out to be quite lovely. We made some spaghetti in my mom's slow cooker whilst snacking on chips as we waited for our lunch to get ready. We drank a little to lift our spirits and smoked a ton to ease the nerves. It goes without saying that I'd certainly revisit Rim Forest quite soon, but in the corners of my mind once I got home as this was more than what we expected. Just a relaxing time up in the woods with my girl. After we ate, we decided to take our dog for a walk around the campground. It was 6 p.m. and since all we did was set up camp and eat, we figured that this would be our hike for the evening. It was starting to get a little colder so we decided on our hike, we'd head to the groundkeeper's post to buy some firewood so we could get our campfire started. As we made our way up the paths of the empty campground, we came to find the groundkeeper's post deserted. Anyone here? I asked, knocking on their door. It dawned on me that the old couple were the only two people running this whole place and when I remembered the sign that greeted us at the entrance, I came to the conclusion that perhaps they're still making their rounds through the entire place. We headed back to our campsite with our blankets in mind as the temperature started to lower at a rapid rate. We agreed upon the idea of waiting at the campsite to hopefully catch the elder couple on their way back up to their lodge. 30 minutes pass and no sign of anybody. The couple next to us has been in their RV all day and with the temperature dropping, we knew there'd be no sign of seeing them come out anytime soon. An hour passes and still nobody. Think we should wait a little while longer, honey? My girlfriend asks me. I dunno, babe. I think we should probably wait in the tent. The sun had set and we were all shivering at this point, dog included. If we heard their golf cart, we could just get out of the tent and get their attention so we decided to get in the tent. We grabbed a couple things. From the car since at this point, we realized we wouldn't be leaving the tent anymore in the evening as it was blistering cold outside. We changed into our PJs and mummified ourselves with our sheets as we made a few sandwiches to snack on. We waited in the warmth. Nothing but the sounds of nature. Let's just go to sleep, I say. No point now to wait since it's dark outside and the weather was uninviting. Think we should maybe leave tomorrow? I can hear the reluctance as she asked. Hey, I had a great time, baby, even if we don't stay the plan two days. I kiss her on the forehead and we lulled off to sleep. The night was peaceful. We had only the wilderness to score the rest of this evening's motion picture so sleep only came right after getting accustomed to the nighttime corral of the critters. Though my girlfriend was next to me, I was alone in a battle of wits against myself as I shoved back any irrational fear that came to mind. When you're thrown into a scenario you've once read about, you can't help but assume the worst. It took a lot of tiny reminders to keep myself in check. I've been camping before so this isn't anything new to expect. I kept thinking back to my desert trip last year and how that was an even scarier scenario, with real things to fear. There aren't any rattlesnakes here in the woods. No scorpions or any weird poisonous insects of the sort either. What do I know though? I'm no camper. Fact of the matter is, even being as inexperienced as I am with the outdoors, I know to respect the wilderness and to leave them be in the event that I ever encounter anything. After all, nature's got a whole arsenal of things that can kill you if you don't know any better. As I was pushing all those fears back to from where they came, I was startled by a scratching noise I heard against the tent's nylon. I gripped my girlfriend's shoulder scared out of my wits but, thankfully, it was just our dog. She needs to pee, my girlfriend mutters, face deep in her pillow. 
I tell her to go back to sleep and that I'll take the dog out. I shuffle out of the seats and scramble to find the zipper of the tent door. In a daze, I open the tent door all the way before even thinking that I would need any light. Darkness. Complete utter darkness. I snapped out of my hypnosis cast on me by the darkness when I remembered my duty, I gotta step outside to let the dog pee. I remembered the lantern and armed myself with a sense of security before leashing up the dog and setting foot into the dark. You've done shit like this before, it's no big deal. Over and over again in my head. We didn't wander. Too far from the tent, but each step I took would have been engulfed in total blackness had it not been for the light. Once she was done, we booked it straight for the tent. I woke my girlfriend on my way in and she ushered me to return to our huddle. Scary out there, I say in her ear. She pulls my arm over her being and holds it to her chest. You're here now, she whispers, and with that, we dozed back off. The night progressed. My girlfriend was fast asleep and again, I was left alone to my thoughts. I began to notice though that this time around, the evening chatter of the wild was nowhere to be heard. Only the occasional gust of wind would greet us with the sound of leaves among other things brushing up against our tent. It was starting to feel eerie. I couldn't help but think about how nice our neighbors must have it. Nice and warm in their RV, with actual, rigid walls around them to keep them safe from the outside. I don't think I'd ever buy an RV. I'll probably eat those words later in my life but for right now, Camping in a trailer or RV isn't really camping in my mind's eye. But then again, how many inches of separation between them and the wild does one constitute that theirs are too thick to be considered camping? Like I said, it was just me and my mind going back and forth with each other with each and every thought furthering myself from slumber. I wasn't having a miserable time, no, I was just psyching myself out. After all, I shouldn't have anything to be afraid of as I've got my girlfriend with me in our tent away from the wild. If it's one thing, it's much more dangerous in my head than it is in this tent here with what brings me the most comfort. But just as I was beginning to calm down, my ears did me the disservice of picking up something that at that present moment I didn't wish to hear. A twig snapped somewhere in the distance. All right. This is it. The moment your entire pristine camping career has been waiting for. I would have easily dismissed it as the wilderness around us and go back to not caring had the rest of the forest sounds been present but with how silent it's been, I couldn't help but hone in on where that snap came from. I knew my mind would eat this shit up. More fodder for it to process into another worst case scenario that I'll have the unpleasure of thinking about in no time. Even the wind quieted down as I was focusing my hearing to the outside. The snap wasn't too close to our sight but what had me in anticipation was what will I hear next and where? While honing in on the silence, my ears pick up another noise. A footstep. I discerned it to be a footstep by the sound the earth made from below, a trudgy, mulchy, heavy sounding foot against the soft earth surrounding our campsite. It wasn't a thud or a thump but a calculated footstep as if it were trying to be inaudible. I heard another one. I was trying to decipher the footfall of what was coming to our tent to hear if it belonged to an animal or a human. It was moving at such an uneven pace but I was still able to clearly hear step after step, closer and closer. It was headed to our tent. My arm tightened around my girlfriend as the two of us were huddled together. I couldn't tell if she was still sleeping but as the footsteps continued, that question was answered as I felt my girlfriend's grip on my arm tighten as well. Did you hear that? I mutter the quietest yes I could. Awake and alert, we began listening together in fear of what's to come next. My mind couldn't stop racing. There were brushes against the tent that only heightened the fear we were feeling. Panicked. My girlfriend says to breathe with our mouths in a yelling yet whispering fashion. I was thinking about the sign that we saw at the entrance of the camp. I was thinking about the last thing the old man said about keeping our dog on a leash. I couldn't help but actually feel that there was something out there. Then it happened. From the corner where our heads were resting, the fiberglass wireframe began to shake violently as if it were being strummed like a guitar. 
I couldn't tell what was louder at this point, the metallic vibration of the wireframe reverberating or the thump of my heart, beating sporadically in my chest echoing all the way up into my ears. We were all huddled together by now. I held on to my girlfriend while she cuddled our dog. We were holding on for dear. Life. I kept saying to my girlfriend over and over that the noise was just our tent. We spent a good while hammering that last stake in, it must have untimely uprooted itself and the release of tension was causing our tent to shake. It took all my being to calm my girlfriend down. My own fears just weren't important anymore. We'll go home in the morning, baby. I'm right here, hon, it's all over now. Day broke. It was about 7 AM when we woke up. It took a while to make any sense of what happened last night, but we decided to pack up camp and head back home without thinking much of it. Sorry we're leaving early, baby, my girlfriend tells me. Babe. I had a wonderful time with you up here in the woods. I'm sorry your first ever experience was marred by what happened last night. It's okay. Oh my goodness, it really is. I still had a lot of fun. I'm really glad you didn't think this trip ended in failure. I just got so scared. And it happens, love. I was afraid that if this trip did go well, you'd never want to go again. I'd like to go camping with you again. I had fun. And we did have fun. So, there's my camping story, everyone. I know, I know. As I'm going over it one last time before submitting, I can see how much of an allegory my story is in comparison to all the more interesting ones I've read in the past that always give me the creeps. Not much happened. No accounts of skin walkers or any random flights of staircases out in the woods. But what I'll always have to give me the creeps that I'll keep in the back of my mind is that when I took down our tent that morning, all the stakes were still firmly planted into the ground. While camping in the Cascade Mountains in the summer of 2016 here in Oregon, I woke up in the middle of the night with nature calling. I rolled out of the tent with my headlamp on, realizing I should probably grab my handgun just in case of cougars, bears, or even windigos, oh my. Ducking back into the tent, I grabbed my gun and suddenly heard breathing to my left, causing my stomach to jump into my throat. I spun around towards the source of the breathing and my headlamp landed directly on a grungy, dirt cake dude standing at the perimeter of my camp. I shouted, Jesus freaking Christ on a bike. Yes, nature went from calling to screaming. The poor guy was equally horrified upon seeing a 6 foot 5 inches, 250 pound man with a Glock 21 in one hand and urinating while blinding him with a headlamp. It turned out that he had been lost in the forest for three days after crashing his mountain bike and falling off the trail. He was dehydrated and hungry, and he was just so relieved to find someone that he didn't even consider how creepy his approach might seem. We shared some food, packed up our camp, and I drove him two hours to the nearest town, Sisters, Oregon. The police got in contact with his girlfriend and let her know he was okay. She arrived an hour later, and they thanked me by buying me breakfast. All ended well. The moral of the story? Always pack extra pants and underwear when venturing into the wild. I was camping in Montana in a fairly secluded area with a female friend, I'm also a girl, and my dog. At the dead end of a road was four campsites by a lake. The first night it was us and a family there and the second night the family had left and so it was just me and my friend. Important to know, on the far side of the lake there were some houses, but they were too far for us to really hear or be bothered by. Anyway it's fairly late so we head to bed. My friend is dead asleep and I'm trying to fall asleep when I hear the sound of a sputtering, dinky little motorboat coming closer. Kind of weird, but whatever. It comes closer and closer, and then I hear it just kind of hovering right at the edge of our side of the lake. Then I hear a creepy old man's voice. Hey girls come in my boat we can go party at my house across the lake. WTF. I'm freaking out and completely freeze and stop breathing. 
I try and nudge my friend awake but she's knocked out. He tries calling out hey girls a few more times and we are just quiet. I guess upset at getting no response he shines a huge light right at our tent and starts yelling I know you girls are in there. Come on we are going to have so much fun at my house, just you wait and see. I'm pissing myself I have a knife that I'm gripping super hard and trying to come up with a plan if he actually comes up. My dog is protective but also quiet so at this point he's just alert and waiting. He tried calling us out a for a few more minutes, felt like hours to me. Then finally I guess he gave up and I heard the boat driving away. I stayed up the whole night convinced he would come back to murder us, and the next morning I told my friend what happened and we booked it out of there. Might have been some horny old perv, but it felt more sinister than that. Haven't been back to that spot since. Not as much creepy as it was scary at the time but when I was 16 I was in a wilderness camp in between group homes, long story short, I was a troubled youth. So we're all camping in the mountains of Utah, about 10 kids and 2 adults. Nothing fancy, just a sleeping bag and a basic tarp hanging above us. I'm lying awake staring at the sky between the trees and the kid next to me whispers that he sees something, I look, don't see it and go back to the stars. A moment later I heard something maybe 30 to 40 feet away near the remnants of our fire. I look over and there are 6 or 7 coyotes just walking around. They were in our campsite for a while walking around sniffing stuff, circling the area and scaring the shit out of a bunch of us city kids. The creepy part is that for the most part you could just see their eyes and I still remember thinking if I can see his eyes that means he's looking right at me. 15 years later and I still thoroughly enjoy camping and I still can't remember how that coyote night ended. I guess I said F it and just fell asleep. Late fall. 17 years old camping in a dry creek bed at the base of a large ridge on a friend's property. About 6 to 7 of us around a campfire joking and telling stories. Then, about 10 to 15 yards behind my left shoulder, 7 o'clock, comes this hair-raising scream. It was so loud and so unexpected, and lasted about 15 to 20 full seconds. The only way I could describe it was a woman's scream while being murdered, or a banshee. I sat up, and didn't dare move, while my friends were staring at me waiting for whatever it was to snatch me back into the darkness. Never found out what it was, although I've heard wild cats scream in the past, so that's probably what it was. Although, it was so clear and distinct, without the scratchiness and the voice that cats have. I hiked the ridge later that winter and remember sitting down on a log to rest. I could hear heavy footsteps walking through the leaves, deliberate, but I never could see what it was. I just backed out slowly with knife in hand, thinking it was a mountain lion. As kids, us four brothers we were camping at remote site by the lake in Ellsworth, Michigan. Outside, the kerosene lantern hanging in a tree lit up the side of our tent. During one of the ghost stories, a shadow of a man holding an axe was cast upon the outside of the tent. We laughed and screamed and the shadow soon walked away towards the lake, not to the Ford Galaxy station wagon where we could hear our dear old dad snoring. 50 years later, we still talk about that spooky night. Camping in British Columbia, Canada with my girlfriend at the time. We are at a provincial campground, so other campsites are in the vicinity. As I'm close to falling asleep I hear footsteps near my tent. Nothing to be immediately alarmed about, could easily be a nearby camper, but it was around 2 a.m. so late enough that it alerts my senses. Then I faintly hear what I believe to be my car door lifting, along with my heart rate. I have hatchet and flashlight beside the bed, but never realized how vulnerable you are when trying to get out of a small tent until that moment. In my best effort I unzip quickly and spring up, 
hatchet in hand looking 360 around tent with the beam of the flashlight. Nothing. The woods get really creepy when you're sure something is hiding from you. I'm so spooked we pack up the tent right then and there in the middle of the night, simply folding it up, wet, of course, and shoving it in the trunk. We drive home and the next day get a call from the campsite host. Turns out a vehicle was stolen that night, so what I thought I heard was all validated. There must have been someone hiding behind a tree when I popped out there was nowhere else to hide. The new girlfriend thinks I'm crazy with my camping pre-sleep preparations. About 5 or 6 years ago I was camping with a close friend. We were on a really large chunk of private property behind some industrial buildings that were up against a main road in SoCal. The land had to have been a couple hundred acres big and it was known to have abandoned hobo camps here and there, being we used to airsoft down there as kids. Yes I know this isn't really considered camping, but at the time to a couple of 18 year olds it was perfect. Anyways, we were sitting around the fire that night laughing, making s'mores, chatting it up, when directly behind me, had to have been what sounded like 20 yards behind me. I hear footsteps crunching around in the bushes at a very slow stocky kind of pace. All at once we went dead silent, not making a move, being that our hearts jumped into our throats. We've never heard or seen someone else out there before. I had thoughts racing through my head like, those aren't animal sounding footsteps, who or why would someone be creeping around our campsite? They must know we can hear them. As these thoughts and many others are racing through my mind, the footsteps are getting closer. We are losing our minds, while being dead quiet my heart is about to explode out of my chest, my friend and I, start backing up in the opposite direction slowly and quietly while clenching onto whatever defensive item we had on us at the time. We backed up and hid ourselves inside of a hollow bush dead quiet for what felt like 20 or 30 minutes just listening. We didn't hear a thing after about 5 or 10 of those minutes. Yet I was still absolutely scared thinking that someone was waiting for us to get comfortable or was hoping we'd leave, I had no clue. After those 20 or 30 minutes were up, the voice of reason popped into my head thinking we're being ridiculous. My friend and I agreed to just, walk back up to the campsite and just pretend nothing happened and if something was going to happen we'd just figure out a way to deal with it in a way that wasn't hiding in a bush for a half hour. We never did find out what on earth that noise was, or where it came from. It could have been a hobo who stumbled upon our campsite with curiosity, it could have been something or someone else, or it could have been our minds playing tricks on us. Who knows, but what I do know was in that moment I was absolutely terrified. Walking back to the main camp with a few friends and scouts. We were like 15 and really liked horror movies by the way. Anywho we were about 10 more minutes to camp on a trail in the middle of the woods nearly alone when we heard a chainsaw being revved up. We ran faster than the speed of light. Well until I did the typical horror movie thing and tripped and twisted my ankle, but unlike those dolts, I got up and limped as fast as I could. Everyone was fine. Had no idea where this dude could have been. Mind you there were no parents nor scoutmasters or anybody for that matter, most everyone had gone home that Sunday morning. I would suspect someone had stayed behind just to scare the living Jeebus of suburbia out of us but no one else was at the camp all night, or in the morning. Just the four of us. Last summer my dad, my young son and I went up to the local campgrounds and paid for three nights. Maybe a 30 minutes after the sun set, my dad and I were sitting by the fire about to have a few beers and my son was in the tent watching his portable DVD player. I hear leaves crunching coming up towards us but just assume it's a raccoon or a possum. My dad jumps up yelling get out of here bear. Get out of here. Get. There's a smallish black bear two feet away from the open tent, walking towards it. We were yelling, clapping our hands, I was smacking a hiking stick on the ground as hard as I could. 
It wasn't afraid of us at all. It had almost no reaction to us. Then it started to slowly walk away. So we're freaked out after that and we're just sitting there for 30 minutes scanning the area with our flashlights, overreacting to every twig snap and leaf crunch, plenty of deer and some raccoons out there. So I'm like Terry's plenty of other campsites for this bear to check out. We're fine. It's not going to come back. Well, as soon as I say that, we see it walking from behind my dad's truck. IT had three cubs with IT. We didn't know much about black bears at the time aside from the common misinformation that they were extremely aggressive if their cubs were around. After more yelling and stick slamming we scare the bear away again and she sends her cubs up a tree at the site across from ours and disappears into the woods. At this point we're just like F it, we're going home and we'll come back for our stuff tomorrow we get in the truck and leave. We get to the exit road and the gate is up and padlocked so we have no choice but to spend the night. We head back to camp, get my son in the tent, zip it up and we're just sitting there shining our lights around all paranoid. Guess who shows up? The mama bear comes back and is under the tree her cubs are in. She's getting pissed at us shining our lights at her and she's snorting and clapping her jaws every time we do. We don't want to take our eyes off her you know? Eventually she makes a noise and her three cubs climb down and they all scurried away together. We were paranoid as f the next few hours but finally tried to get some sleep. As soon as we dosed off she was back, messing around my dad's truck. We scared her off again and that was the last we saw of her. We packed up and went home before sunset the next day. We told a ranger what happened and he said some dumbass left a cooler full of meat out and the bear got it just a few nights before we arrived so that's why it kept coming into our campsite. I legit had PTSD for a few nights after Lamau. I'd be laying in my safe warm bed and be way too alert and jumpy to every little noise lol. Found a room for rent paid the deposit because the renter said some girl was about to come back and put the money down if I didn't first. He seemed okay, so I got the money, handed it over, and signed the lease. I got a call two days before moving in from him. He said he'd been arrested and wouldn't be there to let me in, I didn't have a key yet. But I had to move out, so he offered me the option of giving me my money back and searching for a new apartment two days before I had to move. I showed up at his place to get the deposit, he wasn't there. I called and his number had been disconnected. I found a subletter on Craigslist the next day, thankfully, saw the place, and found the room I was moving into was sopping wet. He said he just had it shampooed so it'd be dry in 24 hours. 24 hours later, the place was still wet and reeked of mildew. I couldn't move my stuff into the room but I had to move out of my old place. So, I gave him the deposit and moved in. I slept on the couch that night, went to work, and found he'd spent my deposit on electronics. Turns out, he was behind payments from his landlord and was about to be evicted. And the floor was still wet approximately 48 hours later. I demanded my money back since the landlord was kicking him out. Obviously, he didn't have it. So, a friend of mine came to the rescue. Put me up in his place for a month free of charge while I searched, I found a third place. It was fine for the time being. The roommates were nice. The room sucked. Hi all, been a lurker for a while. I love this subreddit and I've got an experience to post that my boyfriend and I went through just a few days ago. This is long. But here goes. I'm still scared. We recently moved to Salem, Massachusetts a couple of weeks ago and had a place set up with roommates but it fell through at the last minute and we were left stranded with nowhere to go for the night. We walked to a nearby town to try and find a place to sleep for the night until we were able to figure things out. Boyfriend is working and I'm still looking for a job and have several interviews next week. Anyways, to the story. So after having nowhere to go and being desperate, it's also around 3 a.m. So my boyfriend posts a Craigslist ad reaching out for help. I know Craigslist is risky and this story is why. 
Someone responded to the ad and offered us a place and we found our way to the address. When we got there, an old disheveled and very dirty looking man was at this garage on a big hill littered with old camper trailers and abandoned vehicles. It looked like a literal Junliard. We introduce ourselves and he tells us he's got a place in this shack in an attic. My boyfriend was sketched out and so was I, but we were so exhausted from walking all night that we really really needed sleep so we took it. The attic was filthy and cold, 40 degrees or less, and there was a dirty mattress and some blankets. He said he took in a junky couple but they left without notice months ago. Really sketchy but I needed to sleep. He let us sleep for the day and when we woke up, we decided to go to a nearby McDonald's to charge our phones and see if any friends answered if we could stay with them temporarily. The guy Richard, starts texting my phone and leaving me voicemails saying how we don't trust him and why did we leave. So I sent a text back saying we were charging our phones and we'd be back to talk to him. After that he sent me a text saying in all caps I guess you don't trust me bye. I'm like, WTF? So I call him and explain the situation and he starts saying how we need to come back so he can talk to us about the place. We come back and he's very visibly drunk. He starts rambling on about how he's not a child molester and how we're stupid for going to McDonald's to charge our phones and we're stupid for buying food at McDonald's because he has food for us. I wanted to leave then but I don't know anyone here, my boyfriend does, but his friends all live with their parents and everyone said no to us staying with them. So, boyfriend goes to the store to get smokes and I stayed behind to help creepy Richard with some stuff in the yard. He starts almost interrogating me asking would I die for boyfriend, do I trust him, how much do I love him. I tell him yes I trust him and I love him. He tells me I'm stupid and that he's just gonna leave me and it won't work out. We've been together 3 years and are very close. He would never leave me because we're very loyal to each other. Richard then stands up and starts kind of darting around back and forth around me, like he's staring at me and around me. Kind of like he's trying to read me. I asked him what he was doing because it made me uncomfortable and he shook his head as if coming out of a trance and apologized. Then he said I was stupid for trusting my boyfriend and he then says again how he's not a child molester. No one even said anything remotely relevant to this, so it was suspicious that he kept trying to stress to us he wasn't a molester. Then he tells me that he's a mean person and has been accused of killing and raping people but that he's not a rapist but he's killed someone. I start panicking and boyfriend returns. We are alone in the attic and I tell him what happened with Richard and he's panicked and we're not sure what to do because no one can take us in and we didn't have enough money for a motel until a few days later when he got paid. So we try to stick it out a bit and decide if Richard tries something we can protect ourselves. Next day, boyfriend goes to work and I'm there alone and scared. I have my phone and am able to talk to boyfriend while he's at work. Richard keeps finding excuses to come up to the attic and talk to me. He asks me if I want to take a shower at some random guy's house I don't know. I said no and made up an excuse about not wanting to get sick with wet hair. He asks again and again trying to convince me and I said no I'm not leaving without boyfriend. He finally leaves me alone about it but still keeps finding excuses to come talk to me. Boyfriend finally comes back after work and I'm really panicked and crying and begging to leave. We figure something out and are able to get to his mom's. That night Richard comes back up to the attic saying he's gotta talk to boyfriend and I go with him into his camper trailer with boyfriend. There's a computer monitor hooked up to a TV. With a naked woman, there's stacks of adult pornography DVDs all over. The place reeks of a horrid smell we can't describe. I wanted to leave right then. Finally we attempt to sleep one more night there and around 4 am in the shack below us, we hear lots of banging and hammering and all kinds of loud noises. We're both panicked and stay quiet since he's right below us. We hear him talking to himself in full conversation as if someone was around. No he wasn't on his phone. After about an hour he comes up there and starts asking boyfriend to help him with some heavy loading of junk into a truck. Boyfriend says no and explains we're leaving and we have to be somewhere to catch the train at a specific time that morning. 
Richard gets visibly irritated and tries to keep us there again. Finally we're able to leave. Boyfriend's mom gets us and I start crying and begging to please not take us back there. She's confused because she doesn't know what's happened because boyfriend was scared to tell her. Finally we tell her the whole story and she's concerned and empathetic with us. She says she's going to make sure we don't go back. This is now one day later I'm writing this, and we've found a friend who's letting us crash for a few weeks until we save up some paychecks. I was looking on Craigslist to see about apartment rentals and I see Richard's ads about needing a female roommate and wants pictures and such. I knew it was him because he said he was moving to Maine soon and he told us a lot about his plan to move to Maine. There's currently about 8 ads on Craigslist all from him looking for a female roommate in Salem and he's 53 years old named Richard and moving to Maine. This scared me even more because I don't know if he's trying to lower in females or not. If boyfriend never showed up from work I know I'd probably be dead now. I got horrible vibes from the man and honestly thought we'd die there. I have his phone number and wanted to see if I could find his full name to do an internet arrest search. I was unable to get results without paying and I can't afford that. I'm debating placing an anonymous call to the cops about his address and what he's saying about he killed someone and everyone says he's a molester. I never want to see that place again. Story time. I wasn't sure where else to post these stories, so I figured I'd share them here. I've been an SAR officer for a few years now, and along the way I've seen some things that I think you guys will be interested in. I have a pretty good track record for finding missing people. Most of the time they just wander off the path, or slip down a small cliff, and they can't find their way back. The majority of them have heard the old stay where you are thing, and they don't wander far. But I've had two cases where that didn't happen. Both bother me a lot and I use them as motivation to search even harder on the missing persons cases I get called on. The first was a little boy who was out berry picking with his parents. He and his sister were together, and both of them went missing around the same time. Their parents lost sight of them for a few seconds, and in that time both the kids apparently wandered off. When their parents couldn't find them, they called us, and we came out to search the area. We found the daughter pretty quickly. And when we asked where her brother was, she told us that he'd been taken away by the bear man. She said he gave her berries and told her to stay quiet, that he wanted to play with her brother for a while. The last she saw of her brother, he was riding on the shoulders of the bear man and seemed calm. Of course, our first thought was abduction, but we never found a trace of another human being in that area. The little girl was also insistent that he wasn't a normal man but that he was tall and covered in hair, like a bear, and that he had a weird face. We searched that area for weeks, it was one of the longest calls I've ever been on, but we never found a single trace of that kid. The other was a young woman who was out hiking with her mom and grandpa. According to the mother, her daughter had climbed up a tree to get a better view of the forest, and she'd never come back down. They waited at the base of the tree for hours, calling her name, before they called for help. Again, we searched everywhere, and we never found a trace of her. I have no idea where she could possibly have gone, because neither her mother or grandpa saw her come down. A few times, I've been out on my own searching with a canine, and they've tried to lead me straight up cliffs. Not hills, not even rock faces. Straight, sheer cliffs with no possible handholds. It's always baffling, and in those cases we usually find the person on the other side of the cliff, or miles away from where the canine has led us. I'm sure there's an explanation, but it's sort of strange. One particularly sad case involved the recovery of a body. A nine-year-old girl fell down an embankment and got on a dead tree at the base. It was a complete freak accident, but I'll never forget the sound her mother made when we told her what had happened. She saw the body bag being loaded into the ambulance, and she let out the most haunting, heartbroken wail I've ever heard. It was like her whole life was crashing down around her, and a part of her had died with her daughter. I heard from another SAR officer that she killed herself a few weeks after it happened. 
She couldn't live with the loss of her daughter. I was teamed up with another SAR officer because we'd received reports of bears in the area. We were looking for a guy who hadn't come home from a climbing trip when he was supposed to, and we ended up having to do some serious climbing to get to where we figured he'd be. We found him trapped in a small crevasse with a broken leg. It was not pleasant. He'd been there for almost two days, and his leg was very obviously infected. We were able to get him into a chopper, and I heard from one of the EMTs that the guy was absolutely inconsolable. He kept talking about how he'd been doing fine, and when he'd gotten to the top, a man had been there. He said the guy had no climbing equipment, and he was wearing a parka and ski pants. He walked up to the guy, and when the guy turned around, he said he had no face. It was just blank. He freaked out, and ended up trying to get off the mountain too fast, which is why he'd fallen. He said he could hear the guy all night, climbing down the mountain and letting out these horrible muffled screams. That story bothered the hell out of me. I'm glad I wasn't there to hear it. One of the scariest things I've ever had happen to me involved the search for a young woman who'd gotten separated from her hiking group. We were out until late at night, because the dogs had picked up her scent. When we found her, she was curled up under a large rotted log. She was missing her shoes and pack, and she was clearly in shock. She didn't have any injuries, and we were able to get her to walk with us back to base ops. Along the way, she kept looking behind us and asking us why that big man with black eyes was following us. We couldn't see anyone, so we just wrote it off as some weird symptom of shock. But the closer we got to base, the more agitated this woman got. She kept asking me to tell him to stop making faces at her. At one point she stopped and turned around and started yelling into the forest, saying that she wanted him to leave her alone. She wasn't going to go with him, she said, and she wouldn't give us to him. We finally got her to keep moving, but we started hearing these weird noises coming from all around us. It was almost like coughing, but more rhythmic and deeper. It was almost insect-like, I don't really know how else to describe it. When we were within sight of base ops, the woman turns to me, and her eyes are about as wide as I can imagine a human could open them. She touches my shoulder and says. He says to tell you to speed up. He doesn't like looking at the scar on your neck. I have a very small scar on the base of my neck, but it's mostly hidden under my collar, and I have no idea how this woman saw it. Right after she says it, I hear that weird coughing right in my ear, and I just about jump out of my skin. I hustled her to ops, trying not to show how freaked out I was, but I have to say I was really happy when we left the area that night. This is the last one I'll tell, and it's probably the weirdest story I have. Now, I don't know if this is true in every SAR unit, but in mine, it's sort of an unspoken, regular thing we run into. You can try asking about it with other SAR officers, but even if they know what you're talking about, they probably won't say anything about it. We've been told not to talk about it by our superiors, and at this point we've all gotten so used to it that it doesn't even seem weird anymore. On just about every case where we're really far into the wilderness, I'm talking 30 or 40 miles, at some point we'll find a staircase in the middle of the woods. It's almost like if you took the stairs in your house, cut them out, and put them in the forest. I asked about it the first time I saw some, and the other officer just told me not to worry about it, that it was normal. Everyone I asked said the same thing. I wanted to go check them out, but I was told, very emphatically, that I should never go near any of them. I just sort of ignore them now when I run into them because it happens so frequently. I have a lot more stories, and I suppose if anyone's interested, I'll tell some of them tomorrow. If anyone has any theories about the stairs, or if you've seen them too, let me know. Part 2. So I logged back on tonight and was blown away by the staggering amount of interest this seems to have generated. First off, I'll address a few things that you guys have brought up. There's been an overwhelming amount of people mentioning the similarity between some of my stories and those of David Paulide. I assure you I'm not trying to rip him off in any way, I've got nothing but respect for the guy. He's actually what inspired me to write this, 
because I can verify a lot of the things he talks about. We do have a lot of these strange missing persons cases, and most of the time they aren't solved. Either that, or we find them in places they have no business being. I personally haven't been on many calls like that, but I'll share a few that I've seen, and a story my friend told me that relates to this. There was a lot of feedback about the stairs, so I'll touch on that briefly here, and I'll also include a story. They come in a variety of shapes, sizes, styles, and conditions. Some are pretty dilapidated, just ruins, but others are brand new. I saw one set that looked like they came from a lighthouse, they were metal and spiral, almost old-fashioned. The stairs don't go up infinitely, or farther than I can see, but some sets are taller than others. Like I said before, just imagine the stairs in your house, as if someone cut and pasted them in the middle of nowhere. I don't have any pictures, it's never really occurred to me to try again after the first time, and I don't really feel like risking my job over it. I'll try again in the future, but I can't really promise anything. A few people expressed confusion about the guy who ran into the man with no face. Just to clarify, when the climber ascended and reached the top of this peak, he saw another man in a parka and ski pants. This was the man with no face. Sorry about the confusing wording of that story, I'll try to avoid that in the future. Alright, on to the new stories. As far as missing persons go, I'd say about half the calls I get are related to that. The others are rescue calls, people who fall down cliffs and hurt themselves, get injured by fire, you wouldn't believe how often this happens, mostly drunk kids, get bitten or stung by animals or insects. We're a tight team, and we have veterans who are excellent at finding signs of lost people. That's what makes these cases where we never find any trace of them so frustrating. One in particular was upsetting for all of us, because we did find a trace of them, but it just led to more questions than answers. An older man had been hiking alone on a well-established trail, but his wife called to say that he hadn't come home when he should have. Apparently he had a history of seizures, and she was worried that he hadn't taken his medication and had suffered one out on the trail. Before you ask, I have no idea why he thought it was okay to go out alone, or why she didn't go with him. I don't ask about that kind of thing because past a certain point, it really doesn't matter. Someone is missing, and it's my job to find them. We went out in a standard search formation, and it wasn't long before one of our vets found signs that the guy had gone off the trail. We grouped up and followed him, spreading out on a fan to make sure we were covering as much ground as possible. Suddenly, a call comes over the radio telling us to all head back to the vet's location, and we come right away, because this usually means the missing person is injured, and we need a full team to help get them out safely. We meet back up, and the vet is just standing at the base of a tree with his hands on the sides of his head. I ask my buddy what's going on and he points up into the branches of this tree. I almost couldn't believe what I was seeing, but there's a walking stick dangling from a branch at least 30 feet off the ground. The little strap thing on the handle has been looped around the branch, and it's just hanging there. There's no way the guy could have tossed it up that far, and we don't see any other signs that he's still in the area. We call up into the tree, but it's obvious no one's in it we're all just sort of left scratching our heads. We keep searching for the guy, but we never find him. We even bring our canines out, but they lose his scent long before this tree. Eventually, the search is called off, because there are other calls we have to attend to, and past a certain point there's not much we can do. The guy's wife called us every day for months, asking if we'd found her husband, and it was heartbreaking to hear her get more and more hopeless each time. I'm not sure why this call in particular was so upsetting, but I think it was just the sheer improbability of it. That and the questions that were raised. How the hell had this guy's cane ended up there? Did someone kill him and toss that up there as some weird trophy? We did our best to find him, but it was almost like a taunt. We still talk about that one from time to time. Missing kids are the most heartbreaking. Doesn't matter what circumstances they go missing under, it's never easy, and we always, always dread the ones we find deceased. It's not common, but it does happen. 
David Paulide talks a lot about kids' SAR teams find in places they shouldn't be, or couldn't be. I can honestly say I've heard about this kind of thing happening more than I've seen it, but I'll share one of the ones that I think about a lot that I witnessed personally. A mother and her three kids were out for a picnic in an area of the park that has a small lake. One is six, one is five, and the other is about three. She's watching them all really closely, and according to her, she never lets them out of her sight at any time. She never saw anyone else in the area either, which is important. She packs their stuff up and they start to head back to the parking area. Now, this lake is only about two miles into the woods, and it's on a very clearly established trail. It's almost impossible to get lost getting from the parking area to it, unless you're deliberately going off the path like an imbecile. Her kids are walking in front of her, when she hears what sounds like someone coming up the path behind her. She turns around, and in the four or so seconds she's not looking, her five-year-old son vanishes. She figures he stepped off the trail to pee or something, and she asks her other two where he went. They both tell her that a big man with a scary face came out of the woods next to them, took the kid's hand, and led him into the trees. The two remaining kids don't seem upset, in fact she says later that it seems like they've been drugged. They're sort of spacey and fuzzy. So of course, she freaks out, starts looking frantically in the area for her kid. She's screaming his name, and she says at one point she thinks she heard him answer her. Now obviously she can't go blindly running into the woods, she's got the other two kids, so she calls the police and. They send us out immediately. We respond, and we start the search for him. Over the course of this search, which spans miles, we never find a single trace of the kid. Canines can't pick up any scent, we don't find any clothing or broken bushes or literally anything that would signify a child being there. Of course there's suspicion about the mother for a while, but it's pretty clear that she's completely destroyed by the whole thing. We looked for this kid for weeks, with a lot of volunteer help. But eventually, the search peters out, and we have to move on. The volunteers keep searching, though, and one day we get a call on the radio letting us know that a body has been found and needs to be recovered. They tell us the location, and none of us can believe it. We figure it has to be a different kid. But we go out there, about 15 miles from the site where he vanished, and sure enough, we find the body of the kid we've been looking for. I have been trying to figure out how this kid got where he did ever since we found him, and I've never come up with an answer. A volunteer just happened to be in the area, because he figured he might as well look in places no one else would think to on the off chance the body had been dumped. He comes to the base of a tall, rocky slope, and halfway up, he sees something. He looks through his binoculars and sure enough, it's the body of a little boy, stuffed in a little opening in the rock. He recognizes the color of the kid's shirt, so he knows right away that it's the missing boy. That's when he calls it in, and we're dispatched. It took us almost an hour to get his body down, and none of us could believe what we were seeing. Not only was this kid 15 miles from where he'd started, there was no possible way he could have gotten up there on his own. This slope is treacherous, and it's hard even for us with our climbing gear. A five-year-old boy had no way of getting up there, of that I'm certain. Not only that, but the kid doesn't. Have a scratch on him. His shoes are gone, but his feet aren't damaged or dirty. So it wasn't as if an animal dragged him up there. And from what we can tell, he hasn't been dead that long. He'd been out there over a month by that point, and it looked like he'd only been dead for, at most, a day or two. The whole thing was unbelievably strange, and was one of the most disconcerting calls I've ever been on. We found out later that the coroner determined the kid had died from exposure. He'd frozen to death, probably late at night two days before we found him. There were no suspects and no answers. To date, it's one of the weirdest things I've ever seen. One of my first jobs as a trainee was a search op for a four-year-old kid that had gotten separated from his mom. This was one of those cases where we knew we were gonna find him because the dogs were on a strong scent trail, and we saw clear signs that he was in the area. 
We ended up finding him in a berry patch about half a mile from where he'd been last seen. Kid wasn't even aware that he'd wandered that far. One of the vets brought him back, which I was glad for because I'm really not good with kids, and I find it hard to talk to them and keep them company. As my trainer and I are headed back, she decides to take me on a detour to show me one of the hot spots where we tend to find missing people. It's a natural dip in the land near a popular trail, and people will usually move downhill because it's easier. We hike out there, it's a few miles away, and we get there in about an hour or so. As we're walking around the area and she's pointing out places she's found people in the past, I see something in the distance. Now, this area we're in is about 8 miles from the main parking area, though there's back roads you can take to get closer if you don't want to hike that far. But we're on state protected land, which means there can't be any kind of commercial or residential development out here. The most you'll ever see is a fire tower or makeshift shelter that homeless people think they can get away with building. But I can see from here that whatever this thing is has straight edges, and if there's one thing you learn quickly, it's that nature rarely makes straight lines. I point it out, but she doesn't say anything. She just hangs back and lets me wander over and check it out. I get within about 20 feet of it, and all the hair on the back of my neck stands up. It's a staircase. In the middle of the woods. In the proper context, it would literally be the most benign thing ever. It's just a normal staircase, with beige carpet, and about 10 steps tall. But instead of being in a house, where it obviously should be, it's out here in the middle of the woods. The sides aren't carpeted, obviously, and I can see the wood it's made of. It's almost like a video game glitch, where the house has failed to load completely and the stairs are the only thing visible. I stand there, and it's like my brain is working overtime to try and make sense of what I'm seeing. My trainer comes and stands next to me, and she just stands there casually, looking at it as if it's the least interesting thing in the world. I ask her what the f this thing is doing here and she just chuckles. Get used to it, rookie. You're gonna see a lot of them. I start to move closer, but she grabs my arm. Hard. I wouldn't do that. She says. Her voice is casual, but her grip is tight, and I just stand there looking at her. You are gonna see them all the time, but don't go near them. Don't touch them, don't go up them. Just ignore them. I start to ask her about it, but something in the way she's looking at me tells me that it's best if I don't. We end up moving on, and the subject doesn't come up again for the rest of my training. She was right, though. I'd say about every fifth call I go on, I end up running across a set of stairs. Sometimes they're relatively close to the path, maybe within 2 or 3 miles. Sometimes they're 20, 30 miles out, literally in the middle of nowhere and I only find them during the broadest searches or training weekends. They're usually in good condition, but sometimes it looks like they've been out there for miles. All different kinds, all different sizes. The biggest I ever saw looked like they came out of a turn-of-the-century mansion, and were at least 10 feet wide, with steps leading up at least 15 or 20 feet. I've tried talking about it with people, but they just give me the same response my trainer did. It's normal. Don't worry about it, they're not a big deal, but don't go close to them or up. Them. When trainees ask me about it now, I give them the same response. I don't really know what else to tell them. I'm really hoping someday I get a better answer, but it hasn't happened yet. This is another one that was less spooky and more sad. A young man went missing late in winter, when realistically no one should be going that far out onto the trails. We close a lot of them, but some remain open year-round, unless there's a shitload of snow. We did an op for him, but we had about 6 feet of snow on the ground, it was an unusually heavy snow year, and we knew it wasn't likely that we'd find him until spring when the thaw came. Sure enough, when the first big thaw came, a hiker reported a body a little ways off the main trail. We found him at the base of a tree, in a pile of melted snow. I knew right away what had happened, and it scared the living shit out of me. Most of you who ski or snowboard, or spend any amount of time on a mountain, will probably have guessed too. When snow falls, 
It doesn't collect as thick in the areas beneath the branches. It happens most with fir trees, because they have a sort of closed umbrella shape. So what you end up with is a space around the base of a tree that's filled with a mixture of loose, powdery snow, air, and branches. They're called tree wells, and they're not immediately obvious if you don't know what you're looking for. We put up signs in the welcome center, big ones, letting people know how dangerous they are, but every year that we get an unusual amount of snow, at least one person doesn't read them, or doesn't take the warning seriously, and we find out about it in spring. My best guess is that this young man was hiking and got tired, or maybe a cramp from walking in the deep snow. He went to go sit at the base of the tree, not knowing that there was a tree well, and fell in. He got stuck with his feet up, and the surrounding snow caved in around him. Unable to free himself, he suffocated. It's called snow immersion suffocation, and it doesn't usually happen except in really deep snow. But if you get stuck in a weird position, like this guy did, even six feet of snow can be lethal. What scared me? The most was imagining how he must have struggled. Upside down, in the freezing cold, he didn't die quickly. The snow would have formed a dense, heavy pile on top of him, and it would have been literally impossible to get out. As it got harder to breathe, he would have known what was happening. I can't even imagine what he was thinking in his last moments. A lot of my less outdoorsy friends want to know if I've ever seen the goat man while I've been out on calls. Unfortunately, or I guess fortunately, I've never had anything quite like that happen. I guess the closest was the whole black-eyed man thing, but I didn't see anything. However, there was one call where I had something kind of similar happen but I'm not sure I'm willing to chalk it up to the goat man. We'd gotten a report that an older woman had fainted along one of the trails, and needed assistance getting back down to the main area. We hike up to where she's at, and her husband is just beside himself. He runs, well, I guess more jogs, to us, and tells us that he was a little ways off the trail looking at something when his wife starts screaming behind him. He runs back to her and she's passed out on the trail. We get her on a backboard, and as we're getting her down to the welcome center, she comes to and starts screaming again. I calm her down and ask her what happened. I can't remember verbatim what she said, but essentially, what happened was this, she'd been waiting for her husband when she started hearing this really strange sound. She said it sounded sort of like a cat, but it was off somehow, and she couldn't quite figure out why. She went a little ahead to try and hear it better, and it sounded like it was coming closer. She said the closer it got, the more uneasy she was, until she finally figured out what was wrong. I do remember this next part, because it was so weird that I don't think I could forget it if I tried. It wasn't a cat. It was a man, saying the word meow over and over. Just meow, meow, meow. But it wasn't a man, it couldn't have been, because I've never heard a man make his voice buzz like that. I thought my hearing aid was going out, but it wasn't, I adjusted it and it still sounded all buzzy. It was awful. He was coming closer, but I couldn't see him. And the closer he got the more scared I was, and the last thing I remember was a shape coming out of the trees. I guess that's when I fainted. Now, Obviously I'm a little perplexed as to why a guy would be out in the woods chanting meow, meow at people. So once we get down the mountain, I tell my superior that I'm gonna go search the area to see if I can find anything. He gives me the go ahead, and I grab a radio and hike back to where she fainted. I don't see anyone, so I keep going about a mile more, and I when I head back I go off the trail, to see if I can figure out where she saw him coming from. It's almost sunset by this point, and I don't have any desire to be out at night alone, so I just sort of write it off and make a mental note to check it out again tomorrow. But as I'm headed back, I start to hear something in the distance. I stop, and I call out for anyone in the immediate area to identify themselves. The sound didn't come closer or get louder, but it sounded exactly like a man saying meow, meow in this really odd monotone. As comical as it makes it sound, it was almost like that guy on South Park with the electrolarynx, Ned. 
I go off the trail in the direction I think it's coming from, but I never seem to get closer. It's almost like it's coming from all directions. Eventually, it just sort of fades out, and I ended up going back to the welcome center. I didn't get any further reports like that, and even though I went back to that area, I never heard that exact sound again. I suppose it could have been some stupid kid out there messing with people, but even I have to admit it was weird. So this kind of turned into a massive wall of text, and for that I apologize. I wanted to get to the stories my friend told me, and he does have some good ones, so I'll post those tomorrow evening. I also have a few more of my own I think you guys will like. I'm sorry to keep you all in suspense again, hopefully the stories here make up for it and help you get through the next 24 hours until I can post again. Edit, since it seems like all of you would like to hear more, tomorrow I'll write up as many stories as I can and do a massive post. I'll include my friend's stories, and I'll see if I can't get a hold of a few more people who might have interesting things to talk about. I just wasn't sure how people felt about big huge walls of text, but if you're all okay with it, I'll post lots of stories. Part 3. Well, once again, you guys have blown me away with your staggering amount of responses to my stories. There's no way I can respond to each of you individually, so I'm just going to address some common things again, and then move on to the stories. I'm going to write as many as I can think of, in addition to my friend's stories, and I will probably not update again until I get a chance to answer some questions that I myself have for my superiors. Alright, so the common questions I found you all had. I am not comfortable talking about where exactly I work, unfortunately. In all reality some of the things I've mentioned here could get me in a lot of trouble or fired, so it's best if I just don't discuss too much. I will say that I'm in the United States, and in an area that is comprised of a great deal of wilderness. We're talking hundreds of miles of thick forest, with a mountain range and a few lakes. There is still a great amount of interest in the stairs, and luckily for you guys my friend has a story that I think you'll all be very interested in. I'll go into that more at the end of this update. As for whether or not I have ever thought of asking my superiors about them, I have, but again, I don't want to risk my job. However, one of my former superiors no longer works as an SAR officer, and it's possible that he may be willing to talk to me about it. I'll be speaking to him later in the week, and I will let you all know what comes of that. As far as advice on becoming an SAR officer goes, I think the best advice I can give is to contact your local forest service office and see if they offer in training courses, or what the qualifications are. I've been doing this for years, and I started out as a volunteer helping on SAR operations. It's a great job, despite the occasional tragic situations, and I wouldn't want to do anything else. Alright, let's move on to the stories. The first happened on a case that I went out on right after I got out of training, and was still pretty new to everything. Before I took this job, I was a volunteer, so I had a basic idea of what to expect, but on those calls you're mostly dealing with finding lost people after vets have found signs of them. As an SAR officer, you go out for all kinds of cases, from animal bites to heart attacks. This case got called in early in the morning, from a young couple who were up on one of the trails that goes by the lake. The husband was completely hysterical, and we couldn't really figure out what was going on. We could hear the woman screaming in the background, and he was begging us to come up there right away. When we get there, we see him holding his wife, and she's got something in her arms. She's screaming these awful, almost animal-like screams, and he's sobbing. He sees us and he screams at us to help them to please get an ambulance up there. Now obviously we can't just drive an ambulance up the walking path, so we ask him if his wife needs help, or if she can walk on her own. He's still hysterical, but he manages to tell us that it's not his wife that needs help. I go over while one of the vets tries to calm him down, and I ask the wife what's going on. She's rocking, holding something, and just shrieking, over and over. I crouch down and see that whatever she's holding, it's covering her with blood. That's when I notice the sling on her front and my heart sinks. I ask her to tell me what's going on, 
and I sort of pry her arms gently open so I can see what she's holding. It's her baby, obviously dead. His head is caved in on one side, and he's covered in scratches. Now, I've seen dead bodies before, but something about this whole situation hits me hard. I have to take a second to compose myself, and I get up and go get one of the other vets, who's standing by. I tell him that it's a dead kid, and he sort of pats my shoulder and tells me he'll deal with it. It took us over an hour to get this woman to let us see her kid. Every time we try to take him from her, she flips out and tells us we can't have him, that he'll be okay if we just leave her alone and let her help him. But eventually, one of the vets manages to calm her down, and she gives us the body. We took it back to the med area, but when the EMT showed up, they told us that there was never any hope of saving the kid. He died instantly from the trauma to his head. I was good buddies with one of the nurses who met them at the hospital, and she told me later what had happened. Turns out the couple had been walking with the baby in the sling, and they stopped because the kid was fussing. The dad takes the kid and is holding him, looking out over this little gully by the path. The mom comes to stand next to him, but she ends up stepping on a loose patch of soil, and she trips. She falls into the dad, who drops the kid, who ends up falling about 20 feet down this little gully onto the rocks at the bottom. The dad climbed down and recovered the kid, but he'd fallen right on his head, and was dead by the time he got there. The baby was only about 15 months old. It was a total freak accident, a series of events that coalesced into the worst possible outcome. Probably one of the more awful calls I've been on. I haven't seen a lot of animal bites in my time as an SAR officer, mostly because there aren't that many animals that come around the area. While there are bears in the area, they tend to stay pretty far away from people, and sightings are highly unusual. Most of the animals you'll see are small ones, like coyotes, raccoons, or skunks. What we do see frequently, though, are moose. And let me tell you, moose are nasty creatures. They'll chase after anything for any reason, and God help you if you get in between a female and its baby. One of the more amusing calls was of a guy who'd gotten chased down by an absolutely massive male moose, and was stuck up a tree. Took us almost an hour to get him down, and when he was finally on solid ground again, he looks at me and says, God damn. Them things is big up close. I guess that's not really a scary story, but we still laugh about that one. I honestly don't know how I'd forgotten this story, but it is, by far, the scariest thing that's happened to me. I guess maybe I've tried so long to forget about it that it just didn't come to mind right away. As someone who spends literally all of their time in the woods, you don't ever want to let yourself get scared of being alone, or out in the middle of nowhere. That's why when you have experiences like this, you tend to just forget about them and move on. This is, to date, the only thing that's ever made me really seriously consider if this job is the right one for me. I don't really like talking about it much, but I'll do the best I can to remember it all. As I recall, this took place right at the end of spring. It was a typical lost child call. A four-year-old girl had wandered away from her family's campsite and had been missing for about two hours. Her parents were completely despondent, and told us what most parents do, my kid would never wander away, she's so good about staying close, she's never done anything like this before. We assure the parents that we'll do everything we can to find her, and we spread out in a standard search formation. I was partnered with one of my good buddies, and we were sort of casually holding conversation while we hiked. I know it sounds callous, but you do sort of become desensitized when you've done this long enough. It becomes the norm, and I think to a certain extent you have to learn to desensitize yourself in order to work this job. We search for a good two hours, going well beyond where we think she'd be, and we come out of a small valley when something makes us both stop in unison. We freeze and look at each other, and there's almost a sensation like a plane depressurizing. My ears pop, and I have this odd sensation of having dropped about 10 feet. I start to ask my buddy if he felt that, but before I can, we hear the loudest sound I've ever heard in my life. It's almost like a freight train passing directly by. Us, 
but it's coming from every direction at once, including above and below us. He screams something to me, but I can't hear him over this deafening roar. Understandably freaked out, we look all around us, trying to find the source of the sound, but neither of us sees anything. Of course, my first thought is a landslide, but we're not near any cliffs, and even if we were, it would have hit us by now. The sound goes on and on, and we're trying to yell to each other, but even standing close together we can't hear anything but this sound. Then, as suddenly as it starts, it stops, like someone threw a switch and cut it off. We stand there for a second, perfectly still, and slowly the normal sounds of the woods come back. He asks me what the F just happened, but I just kind of shrug, and we stand there looking at each other for a minute. I get on the radio and ask if anyone else just heard the end of the world, but no one else hears it, even though we're all within shouting distance of each other. My buddy and I just sort of shrug it off and keep going. About an hour later, we all check up on the radios, and no one's found the little girl. Most of the time, we won't search when it gets dark, but because we don't have any kind of lead on her, a few of us decide to keep going, including me and my buddy. We keep close together, and we're calling out for her every couple of minutes. At this point, I'm hoping beyond hope that we find her, because while I may not like kids, the idea of them being out all alone in the dark is awful. The woods can be intimidating to kids in the daylight, at night, well, it's a whole different beast. But we're not seeing any signs of her, or getting any responses, and around midnight, we decide to turn around and head back to the rendezvous point. We're about halfway back when my buddy stops and shines his light to the right of us, into a really thick deadfall, or group of dead trees. I ask him if he's heard a response, but he just tells me to be quiet a second and listen. I do, and in the distance, I can hear what sounds like a kid crying. We both call the girl's name and listen for any kind of response, but it's just this really faint crying. We head in the direction of this deadfall and go around it, calling her name over and over. As we get closer to the crying, I start getting this weird feeling in my gut, and I tell my buddy that something isn't right. He tells me he feels the same way, but we can't figure out what it is. We stop where we are, and call the girl's name again. And at the same time, we both figure it out. The crying is on a loop. It's the same little hitching sob, then wail, then quiet hiccup, repeated over and over. It's exactly the same every time, and without saying another word, we both take off running. It's the only time I've ever lost my composure like that, but something about it was so incredibly wrong, and neither of us wanted to stay out there anymore. When we got back to the rendezvous, we asked if anyone else had heard anything strange, but no one else knew what we were talking about. I know it sounds sort of anticlimactic, but that called me up for a long time. As for the little girl, we never found a trace of her. We keep an eye out for her, and all the other people who we've never found, but frankly I doubt we'll ever find anything. Of the missing persons calls I've gone out on, only a handful have ever resulted in a complete disappearance, meaning no trace of the person and no body ever found. But sometimes, finding a body just leads to more questions than answers. Here are some of the bodies we've found that have become infamous in our team. A teenage boy whose remains were recovered almost a year after he vanished. We found the top of his skull, two finger bones, and his camera almost 40 miles from where he was last seen. The camera, sadly, was destroyed. The pelvis of an older man who had vanished a month earlier. That was all we found. The lower jaw and right foot of a two-year-old boy on the highest peak of a ridge in the southern part of the park. The body of a ten-year-old girl with Down syndrome, almost 20 miles from where she'd vanished. She had died of exposure three weeks after going missing, and all of her clothes were intact except for her shoes and jacket. There were berries and cooked meat in her stomach when they did the autopsy. The coroner said it appeared as if someone had been taking care of her. There were no suspects ever identified. The frozen body of a one-year-old baby, found a week after vanishing in the hollow trunk of a tree 10 miles from the area he was seen last. There was fresh milk found in his stomach, 
But his tongue was gone. A single vertebra and right kneecap of a three-year-old girl, found in the snow almost 20 miles from the campground her family had been at the previous summer. Now on to a couple of the stories my friend told me. I mentioned that you were all interested in the stairs, and you're in luck, he's had a closer encounter with them. Though he doesn't have any explanation for them, he does have a bit more experience with them than I do. My buddy has been an SAR officer for about 7 years, he started when he was a junior in college, and he had a very similar experience when he first encountered the stairs. His trainer told him almost the same thing mine did, which was to never go near, touch, or ascend them. For the first year, he did just that, but apparently his curiosity got the better of him, and on one call he broke away from the line and went to go check a set of them out. He said they were about 10 miles from the path where a teenage girl had vanished, and the dogs were following a scent. He was on his own, lagging behind the main group, when he saw a set of stairs off to his left. They looked like they were from a new house, because the carpeting was pristine and white. He said that as he got closer, he didn't feel any different, or hear any weird noises. He was expecting something to happen, like bleeding from his ears or collapsing but he got right up next to them and didn't feel anything. The only thing, he said, that was odd was that there was absolutely no debris on the steps. No dirt, leaves, dust, anything. And there didn't appear to be any signs of animal or insect activity in the immediate area, which he found strange. It was less like things were avoiding them, and more like they just happened to be in a relatively barren part of the forest. He touched the stairs, and didn't feel anything except that sort of sticky feeling you get from new carpet. Making sure his radio was on, he slowly climbed the stairs. He said it was terrifying, because the way they'd been stigmatized, he wasn't really sure what was going to happen to him. He joked that half of him expected to be teleported to some other dimension and the other half was watching for a UFO to come swooping down. But he got to the top with little event, and he stood there looking around. But, he said, the longer he stood on the top step, the more he felt like he was doing something very, very wrong. He described it as the feeling you'd get if you were in a part of a government building you have no business being in. As if someone was going to come and arrest you, or shoot you in the back of the head, at any second. He tried to brush it off, but the feeling got stronger and stronger, and that's when he realized that he couldn't hear anything anymore. The sounds of the forest were gone, and he couldn't hear his own breathing. It was like some kind of weird, awful tinnitus, but more oppressive. He climbed back down and rejoined the search, and didn't mention what he'd done. But, he said, the weirdest part came after. His trainer was waiting back at the welcome center after the search ended for the day, and he cornered my buddy before he could leave. He said his trainer had this look of intense anger, and he asked what was wrong. You went up them, didn't you? My buddy said it wasn't phrased as a question. He asked how his trainer knew. The trainer just shook his head. Because we didn't find her. The dogs lost her scent. My buddy asked what that had to do with anything. The trainer asked how long he'd been on the stairs, and my buddy said no more than a minute. The trainer gave him this really awful, almost dead eyed look, and told him that if he ever went up another set of stairs again, he'd be fired. Immediately. The trainer walked away, and I guess he's never answered any of the questions my buddy has asked him about it since. My buddy has been involved in a lot of missing persons cases where there's never been a trace of them found. I mentioned David Paulide, and my buddy said he can confirm that those stories are, for the most part, accurate. He said that most of the time, If the person isn't found right away, they're either never found, or they're found weeks, months, or years later, in places they can't possibly have gotten to. One story he told me really stood out that involved a five-year-old boy with a severe mental disability. The little boy vanished from a picnic area in the late fall. In addition to the mental disability, he was also physically handicapped, and his parents explained over and over that he simply could not have vanished. It was impossible. Someone had to have taken him. My buddy said they searched for this kid for weeks, 
going miles out of the accepted range, but it was like he'd never been there. The dogs couldn't pick up his scent anywhere, not even in the picnic area where he'd apparently vanished from. Suspicion fell on the parents, but it was pretty clear that they were devastated, and hadn't done anything sinister to their kid. The search was concluded about a month later, and my buddy said everyone had pretty much forgotten it by later in the winter. He was out on a training op in the snow, on one of the higher peaks, when he came across something in the snow. He said he saw it from far away at first, and when he got closer, he realized it was a shirt, frozen and sticking part way out of the powder. He recognized it as belonging to the kid, because it had a distinctive pattern. About 20 yards away, he found the kid's body, laying partially buried in the snow. My buddy said there was no way the kid had been dead for any more than a few days, even though he'd been missing for almost three months. The kid was curled around something, and when my buddy brushed off the snow to see what it was, he said he almost couldn't believe what he was seeing. It was a big chunk of ice, that had been carved crudely to look sort of like a person. The kid was holding it so tight that it had frostbitten his chest and hands, which my buddy could tell even with the decay that had taken place. He radioed the rest of the crew, and they took the body off the mountain. Now, he recapped all of this for me, and to put it simply, there was no way this kid could have both survived for almost three months on his own, or have gotten to this peak. There was no physical way this child could have walked almost 50 miles and ended up on the top of a goddamn mountain. To top it off, there was nothing in the kid's stomach or colon. Nothing, not even water. It was like, my buddy said, the kid had been taken off the face of the earth, put in suspended animation, and dropped on this mountain months later, only to die of exposure. He's never really gotten over that one. The last story I'll share from him was one that took place relatively recently, only a few months ago. They were out doing a recon for mountain lions, because there had been several reports of sightings in the last couple of days. One of our jobs is to scout out the areas where these animals are seen to ensure that if they are in the area, we can warn people and close off those trails. He was out on his own in a very heavily forested part of the park toward dusk when he heard what sounded like a woman screaming in the distance. Now, as most of you know, when a mountain lion screams, it sounds almost exactly like a woman being brutally murdered. It's unsettling, but far from abnormal. My buddy radioed back and let ops know that he'd heard one, and that he was going to keep going to see if he could figure out where its territory started. He heard the mountain lion scream a couple more times, always from the same spot, and determine the approximate area of the mountain lion's territory. He was about to head back when he heard another scream, this time within only a few yards of him. Of course, he freaks out and starts heading back at a much faster pace, because the last thing he wants is to run into a goddamn mountain lion and get mauled to death. As he got back on the path and started heading back, the screaming followed him, and he broke into a jog. When he was about a mile from Ops, the screaming stopped, and he turned around to see if it was following him. It was almost night by this point, but he said in the distance, just before the path rounded a corner, he could see what looked like a male figure. He called out to them, warning them that the paths were closed, and that he needed to come back to the welcome center. The figure just stood there, and my buddy started to walk over. When he was about 10 yards away, the figure took, as he described, an impossibly long step toward him and let out the same scream my buddy had been hearing. My buddy didn't even say anything, he just turned and sprinted back to Ops, never looking behind him. By the time he got back, the screaming had moved back into the woods. He didn't mention it to anyone else just said that there was a mountain lion in the area and that they would need to close those paths until the animal could be located and moved. I'm going to end this entry here, since it's turned into a huge wall of text. I'm going to be heading out on a yearly training op tomorrow morning, so I'll be gone until early next week. I'll be meeting with a lot of former trainers and buddies who work in other areas of the park, and I'll be asking around about any stories they'd like to share. I'm so glad you guys have been interested in my stories, and once I'm back from this op, I'll continue to share them. To be continued.
1. In 1999 I was 16 years old and my family had just moved to a farmhouse in Center County, Pennsylvania near the Black Mashannon State Park. We had lots of land to roam around on. One summer day I decided to go hiking along some trails in the woods behind the house. Several trails went through the woods and it was easy to get turned around if you didn't pay attention. I walked for about 45 minutes before coming up to a small clearing with a stone fire pit. The area looked like someone had been camping there recently because empty cans and other trash were lying around but no signs of any actual people. I continued on my way thinking I would just tell my mom and dad later. After a half hour of hiking, I came up to a large clearing with a stream running through it. It looked like no one had walked there in quite some time. As I got closer to the stream I noticed something odd about the water. It seemed to be moving faster than normal for this time of year and things were floating in it that shouldn't have been there. There were a lot of twigs and leaves but what really caught my eye were two dead deer carcasses lying on the opposite side of the stream. They both looked fresh and I couldn't figure out why they would have died there. So I decided to cross the stream where the water was moving the slowest to see if I could inspect them closer. As I came upon the first deer I noticed that it had been torn open from the bottom up to its chest cavity. All of the guts were still inside. The second deer was in almost the same condition as the first one except that its head had been removed and was nowhere to be found. I thought this was really strange and confusing. No conscious hunter would do anything like this so I knew something was wrong about this scenario. I turned around and started retracing my steps back along the stream. My anxiety and awareness were building as I walked back. I started to feel like I was being watched and every so often I would look over my shoulder to see if anyone was there. All I could see were trees and the water. As I approached the large clearing I noticed something that made me stop in my tracks. The deer head that was missing from the second deer was stuck on a tree with a stick protruding from the top of its head. Then I thought that there was no way I could have missed this earlier. I was now scared. I wanted to get out of there as fast as possible. But as I looked around it now seemed that someone had just walked through the area. The leaf cover was disturbed. I began to run back down the trail, just hoping that I would get lost. I did make it back home safely. I ran into the house and told my parents everything that had happened. They looked at each other with expressions I'd never seen from them previously. Then my dad went into the closet and grabbed his rifle. He walked out the back door after saying that he knew the area I was talking about. He was gone for what seemed like forever as my mom and I sat on the porch anxiously waiting for him to return home. My mom was trying to keep me calm but I could tell that she was nervous as well. I was so relieved when he did come back safely. He said that the head on the tree was gone or at least he couldn't find it. Based on his description and the leaves being all rustled around at the base of it I believe that he did find the correct tree. He said that someone must have come by while I was back home and taken it off. He did believe me. My dad would periodically go out and check that area from then on. He never found any solid evidence of what had happened. I overheard him telling my mom that the trash I mentioned that was all around the fire pit was cleaned up. He couldn't figure out how people were getting out there. He even sounded really concerned when he said it. It's been almost 25 years since this happened but every time I think about it it makes my skin crawl. The area around the state park has a history of Bigfoot reports. I also remember hearing strange howling coming from that direction, mostly at night. I had mentioned Bigfoot to my dad once, but he said that he doubted that a Bigfoot had left the deer let alone place the head in a tree. We never did figure out what had happened. My parents still live on the property. Every time that I bring up the subject of the dead deer neither of my parents wants to discuss it. I wonder if anything else has been going on that they have not told me. I was walking in a steep creek with my dog looking for arrowheads. This was in South Central Iowa, Warren County. This is the type of creek where the banks are so tall and steep it is difficult to get in and out of, and once you are in there your vision is limited on the sides because you cannot see over the banks. 
It's some pretty remote country and privately owned. After walking for a while I hear what sounds like someone chopping a tree down with an axe, tree knocking sounds. I remember thinking clearly that it made zero sense because where the sounds were coming from was in a very isolated and deep part of the woods and there was no reason for anyone to be back there chopping down a tree. If someone needed wood thousands of other trees were more accessible and no one used axes anymore. This is hardwood country, chainsaws are the norm. I ignored it and kept walking down the creek bed. Then after a few minutes, I heard it again. Still didn't think much of it but I took my walking stick and whacked it against a tree five times in response to the tree knocks I heard coming from up the hillside. Mostly just to mess with whoever was up there. It wasn't long before there were another five tree knocks in response to me, but this time much closer. I started to get a little nervous but wasn't going to let my imagination get the best of me. I have watched too many Bigfoot shows and know they are said to do tree knocks as a form of communication. I kept going but was much more alert and had this eerie feeling starting to sink in like I was being watched. Out of nowhere my dog, who normally stays pretty close to me, put his nose into the air and then took off in a mad dash in the general direction the knocks had been coming from. He scrambled up the bank like a mountain goat and was gone, chasing whatever was up there. Not sure how long, maybe 10 to 15 seconds my dog, who isn't afraid of much, came tearing back down the bank with his tail tucked between his legs and up and out the other side of the creek in an attempt to put as much distance between himself and whatever he encountered. That was all it took for me. I clawed my way out of the creek in the same direction my dog was retreating and probably set a new land speed record for the 400 meter forest dash. I never did see anything but I didn't turn around either. I didn't want to see or waste time looking behind me once I was out of the creek and on level ground. Still makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up to think about it. As soon as the hands gently set me on the hallway's cold tile floor, the bubble is broken, and sound returns. I am flying. My mother has lost her grasp on me and I am flying backwards down the long narrow staircase. The wretched pink snowsuit is now twisted around me and my mother is frozen with horror at the top of the stairs. She is screaming but I don't hear her. I don't hear anything. I am enveloped in a bubble of softness and comfort and I'm airborne. I don't feel the smash of stair treads breaking my tiny bones. I don't feel my skull crack on a series of balusters all the way down. I don't feel my neck break and I don't feel myself die in a crumpled pink heap at the bottom of the staircase. All I feel are the strong hands supporting me in a cushioned envelope while I travel in a slow motion glide down, down, down. As soon as the hands gently set me on the hallway's cold tile floor, the bubble is broken, and sound returns. I am completely unhurt and not frightened. From my perspective, the whole thing has been a gleeful ride. Like the slide at the park. I don't see the owner of the hands but the sense of loving presence and the physical pressure of the individual fingers and upturned palms will brand my body with memory for the rest of my life. Minutes before, red-faced and angry, I was wrestling against the dreaded snowsuit. Anyone who's ever tried to attire a tantruming two-year-old in one knows that it's like trying to get an octopus into a straight jacket. That my mother chose the top of the hallway stairs and the dark hallway of the ancient Brooklyn brownstone to do this, puzzles me still. In her defense, I am choosing to believe that she was out of her mind with grief. Only two or three weeks before, my 18-year-old sister died of an undiagnosed heart defect a fact that will begin another downward descent for my family. One that is unequivocal. I never knew my sister, my parents firstborn, but the effect of her tragic death will profoundly affect me. Already 16 years old when I was born, she was two years older than our brother and four years older than our disabled sister. Somewhere in the years between myself and the next youngest, my mother also gave birth to a full-term stillborn daughter. Some families seem to cope with grief and get to a place of healing. Mine didn't. In the days before it was okay to talk about your feelings, the only option was to cut them off, 
ignore and deny them. Of course grief and anger of this magnitude won't be denied, not really. It just bleeds out in all kinds of toxic and complex ways. In my family, the usual and customary way began with a disagreement. Somebody said something or did something or didn't do something. Starting off small, it would become a screaming or slamming door or throwing things match followed by days of cold silence. My sister's death naturally had a profound effect on my siblings. My brother began acting out shortly after our sister's death and found himself in juvenile detention for two years. He then escaped completely by marrying young. My disabled sister had lost her biggest champion and mentor. Emotionally challenged already, she was often both the subject of and initiator of much of the conflict. My mother's coping method was to become an indomitable whirlwind of activity, anger, and anxiety. Even the smallest thing became a matter of urgency to her and I swear you could hear her crackle with energy. My father who had begun a series of heart attacks in his 30s became her opposite, sullen and morose. He had to retire early with strict instructions not to exert himself. His life became a series of journeys between the couch, the kitchen, and the bed. Unlike my mother's, his brand of anger was of the slow burn variety, exploding suddenly and without warning. His broken heart would kill him just seven years after his daughter. A classic lost child, I learned how to dodge bullets and disappear at will. Drawing and reading upstairs in my room became my refuge as the war raged on beneath me. I often note that I was born just in time to sweep up and turn off the lights in my family. By the time I came into the picture, the family was well into the process of annihilation. I often wonder what would have happened if I had died or sustained massive brain damage on that wintry day in Brooklyn. How much worse would it have gotten for them? How much worse could it have gotten? It seems uncannily fortuitous that such a mercy would be bestowed at such a time of tremendous stress. Most people don't have any memories at all of their two-year-old self. I'm sure I wouldn't either except for the indelible memory of those hands. I am enveloped in a bubble of softness and comfort and I'm airborne. I was too young to correct my mother when she'd retell the story of how the miraculous pink snowsuit saved my life. I couldn't understand why she'd be lying. Didn't she know about the hands? It took a few years for me to recognize the fact that invisible hands are not something experienced in the normal course of events. Nor are they accepted as even possible. Like the lifetime of so-called paranormal incidents ahead of me, I kept it to myself. Was it an angel? A spirit guide? Was it the spirit of my recently deceased sister? Was it some aspect of my higher self? Is there a force in the universe that decides when one more death would be too much? If so, how do you account for the staggering succession of children lost to single families in generations past, before there were inoculations against things like diphtheria and polio? To say I am grateful for that near miss would be to simplify it. While I am grateful, of course, I am also confounded. Of course, I didn't know it then but it was just the beginning of a lifetime series of things that would both intrigue and bewilder me. Angels appear to transcend all cultures, races, and systems. They are a part of human history and civilization, sometimes at the forefront, other times in the shadows, but they are always there. They don't belong to any one particular religion, although many modern people try to associate them with Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. No one religion holds total responsibility for the belief in angels. In truth, these religions only support the existence of angels, they didn't create them. Story time. I'll never forget the events that unfolded during my time as a Navy SEAL in Iraq. People may doubt the supernatural but I swear on my honor that what I'm about to recount is as real as the blood that soaked into the sands of that war-torn coastal region. It was the height of the conflict, and our mission was clear, hunt down Saddam Hussein. We were tasked with conducting a covert operation deep in enemy territory. My team and I were prepared for the dangers of war, but nothing could have prepared us for what we encountered. 
As we moved through the rugged terrain under the cover of darkness, tension hung thick in the air. We knew the risks, but we were determined to fulfill our duty. Suddenly, amidst the eerie silence of the desert, we began to see them, ghostly apparitions of soldiers from battles long past. At first, we thought it was a trick of the mind, a side effect of the stress and exhaustion of combat. But as the figures drew closer, it became clear that these were no ordinary hallucinations. They appeared as Bedouins on camels, wielding old rifles that seemed to glow with an otherworldly light. Panic gripped our hearts as the apparitions advanced upon us. We opened fire, our bullets tearing through the air with deadly precision. But to our horror, the bullets passed right through the ghostly forms, as if they were nothing but wisps of smoke. In the chaos that ensued, we fought with every ounce of strength we possessed, but it was futile. The apparitions seemed invincible, their spectral forms unaffected by our weapons. It was as if we were battling against the very essence of war itself. With heavy hearts and wounded comrades, we were forced to retreat to our base, our minds reeling from the surreal encounter. We filed a report detailing the events that had transpired, but when our superiors reviewed it, they dismissed our accounts as the ravings of soldiers haunted by the horrors of war. But I know the truth. I know that what we faced in that coastal region was more than just a product of our imaginations. It was a glimpse into the dark heart of conflict, where the echoes of past battles lingered like restless spirits, forever haunting those who dare to tread upon the sands of war. This incident occurred on March 18, 2012, in the southern part of Fayette County in Pennsylvania. A man was walking his dog in a rural location at about 11.45 p.m. He was in the front yard and away from any lights when his attention was drawn to look upwards after hearing a whooshing sound coming from overhead. Flying above him at a distance of about 55 feet was a large flying creature that looked like a dragon. As the flying creature passed over an automatic dust to dawn light, the witness was able to get a good look at the strange flying animal. The body was about 22 feet long with a wingspan of about 18 feet wide, and looked to be shiny with almost a reflective body with no scales. The color was dark, possibly brown and red, similar to auburn brown. At the end tip of the wings there appeared to be talon-like fingers about 3 to 4 in number. The arms of the wing structure appeared muscular. The wings were quite thick, not like skin. There appeared to be a rear fin on both sides of its body, and the creature displayed an arrowhead-shaped tail. The witness also saw what appeared to be two extended rear legs. The creature had a cone shape around the head and it stopped flat on the base of the neck. The oddest physical feature that the witness mentioned to me was that the mouth and eyes were illuminated with, a very ominous orange glow. As the creature flew over a tree at the bottom of the yard and moved off in the distance, the fellow heard a deep throaty sound, similar to the foghorn on a boat. The entire observation lasted about 20 seconds. I used to be stationed in Fort Irwin in California. It's a long story, but there is a 30-mile road that leads from Barstow, the closet town, into the base which is in a large empty desert. There are dozens of crosses along the road leading into the base from soldiers and family of soldiers who have had accidents on this road throughout the years. Anyways, a buddy of mine who was my platoon mate and I were driving back from the mall in Virtovo one night. As we entered the starting stretch of Fort Irin Road I noticed some fresh bloody tire marks leading off the side of the road directly into a cross, which was dated something like August 11, 1989, this date was like August 11, 2006. Really creeped me out and I thought I was seeing things. About 20 minutes into our long drive down this isolated two-lane highway leading into the vast empty desert, I look over to my buddy who was driving and lip-syncing to some song. And then as we were going about 75 miles per hour, something darted out in front of us. I quickly caught a glimpse of what looked like a large humanoid beast with fur and a wet hairy face. It looked directly at us even though we were going 75 miles per hour and it was running right across his car. 
The thing was tall. At least seven foot. Walking on two legs. But the eyes. The eyes were like. I don't know how to explain it, but for that split second when it turned to look at us. As it turned its body and I looked into its eyes it was like time slowed down and its eyes were white voids. Not a reflection really. More like dead light, Stephen King reference. And it wasn't a look of fear. But it was a look of I see you hello. It was the most skin crawling thing I have ever experienced. Whatever that was it was not human, not animal. It was sentient, but not. Not like we are. I won't say it had powers but whatever it did to us when we looked at it. I don't know. I turned to my friend who yelled out holy shit. And then the thing. It ran off to the other side of the highway. My buddy thought that we almost hit someone, so we stopped and got out to check, but whatever it was ran off into the empty desert night. And then he began to repeat large. Harry. Bird? No. No not bird. Bear. Bear. No. What? What was that? It took us about another 20 minutes to get to base and we just sat there, music off. Not talking to each other. He was quiet, which he was never quiet, not Brian. I tried to think of what to say, but we were too chill to really talk. Once we got back to base and told our squad members about what had happened, but no one believed us. That is until a few weeks passed by and I started hearing quiet murmurs from people who didn't want to speak openly, but they said that they too saw similar sightings. Years later, after I got out of the service, I did some research online and learned about native folklore passed down by indigenous Native Americans who claimed that Sasquatch was believed to live out in the barren salt flats. Google pulled up a lot of interesting information. Whatever it was. My friend turned white as a ghost that night and we never spoke of it to each other again. This bit is pretty damn creepy since, well, shit got messed up a while back. All I really can say from it, is F Ouija boards. Don't F with that shit. I'm currently on a Navy base. Live in an old building there it's from the 50s, and it's already condemned. Been that way a long while, but it's still in use since they can't keep up with demand, building's pretty shitty, has asbestos in it. Not cool. And some of my shipmates messed up not with alcohol like the CO is always hammering into us with speeches and competitions, or other shit like we hear at Chief's Call every week. No, what these guys did isn't the kind of shit that gets you chewed out by the LPO or anything like that. Nope. These dirtbags brought a Ouija board into the barracks and F all, they summoned some shit that I don't even know. It was a few nights ago, by that I mean a couple weeks, everyone on liberty, I was on duty so couldn't do shit. I was roving watch, basically, me and a partner walk around and do jack shit for a while, because while this place is old, nothing ever happens. I mean, I was the guy who reported the mold in the head, that's the navy term for a bathroom, on the far side, and that's about the most notable thing that happened. Other ships, er, barracks, namely integrated ones had interesting shit like seeing a couple screw behind a vending machine. None of that here. This is one of the last all-male barracks, until this night. Now for a little backstory. Yeah, it's a base, but this one's pretty storied. It's old. Really old. Opened in 1905. Thing is, though it's not just old. This base, has seen quite a bit of death. There's a lot of rules here written in blood. Some kid got hit by snowplow, so we have to wear PT belts after colors, that kind of shit. Well, the buildings right to our sides have had deaths and training accidents flying objects killing people in the GM building, some sailors getting shocked, then dying in their sleep the next day. Second deck, floor, of one of the buildings is said to be haunted by a chief from the 80s. And I've heard stories of dark ominous shadows in one of the other barracks. Our ship? Nothing though. Not really until rather recently. Well, this was the balls to 4 watch or rather midnight to 4 am. Yeah, it's tiring. Not fun being up at 2.40. But nothing out of the ordinary. Everything's fine. 
too cold to rove outdoors, so we kinda had the rotation of picking one of the decks and checking the head, by that I mean go in there and waste time. Nothing unusual barely anyone was up so nothing was happening anyway, anything to pass the time, really. We ducked into a head on the first deck, and found a couple guys in there. So of course, despite the 11 general orders, started talking. One issue, they got drunk and decided in their wisdom to have brought a Ouija board back from wherever the F they had been. And were using it. In the head. At damn near 3 in the morning. Shit, right? What were they planning? Get their ass chewed by a chief of old? Maybe talk to Seaman Jimmy who pointed at the electron tube in the SPS-64 and got zapped by an arc of over 9000 volts? Didn't matter. I told them that they really shouldn't be doing that shit in the ship. They didn't listen and being entirely honest, using a Ouija board isn't against any of the rules, so I technically was out of jurisdiction despite being a watchstander. I told my partner to get the F out of there, we'd go to another one, but he was too intrigued by it. Well, F. They started, and rather quickly got a response. I can't remember what they asked, but shit got weird. First, the lights in the head went out. That's not normal the head always has lights on. There's no light switches in there either due to safety and security reasons. Only way to shut the lights off is by the breaker. Problem, I had checked the gear locker seconds ago no one in there, so it wasn't manually flipped and I had been watching the P-way so there's no way anyone slipped in. Of course, the breaker might have tripped on its own, since that's what breakers are meant to do. I took note of that and then checked. Nope, the breaker was fine. Lights in the head slowly came back on, so brown out? Maybe, but they stayed real dim and flickered. At this point the drunk guys were pretty freaked out. Being that my room was right next to the head, I asked the other rover to hold while I cut in to grab a notebook and pen. Shit was beginning to be weird and I had a responsibility to log it. As I was walking back to the head I heard a loud crash, which made me run over there. The drunkards had bolted. The other rover was pretty petrified. Apparently there was a clear voice, like it had come from the one MC, saying one of the Ouija board user's name. It was deep and guttural. I didn't hear it, so I assumed they were messing with me, but f the look on those guys' faces was one of sheer horror. I couldn't get what the voice had said out of the other rover. He wouldn't say, but shit was only getting started. At this point, all the lights on the entire ship went out. I logged this, didn't catch the exact time since I don't wear a watch and didn't have my phone. Breakers were still good. They came back after about 5 seconds. We went to report, which was good, because the POOW was pretty freaked out. Something popped up on the cameras. Second deck. There was some contemplation on calling the base rover for this. BDO decided against it. Sent us to check. Nothing up there, but when we went up the ladder well, I swore I heard someone whispering from what sounded like the outside. Problem, that's a solid brick wall. Other rover heard it too. We went back, all conditions normal. F no they weren't. We hung out on the quarter deck. Watched the cameras. There was something wrong. A dark shadow came out of the first deck head. Headed towards the back, went to the ladder well. We all saw it. It didn't look right at all. No way it was a bug on the lens or anything, it looked vaguely human. Then we all heard it. That blood-curdling scream. There was a loud scream coming from the head where those idiots messed with the damn board. We ran. Nothing in there. From where we were, there'd been no way anyone could have gotten in or out of the head without us noticing. We've had buds, basically seals who aren't seals yet. Or rather, BMs who don't know their rate yet, on the ship not even they are fast enough to have eluded eyesight there. The watch ended. I was officially done with that shit. I left a log of the events for my relief. And then to my horror, remembered that the head where all this occurred is right next to my room. I got in my rack like normal. Heard some strange noises. Coming from the direction of the head. I don't want to think about them. It's been a couple weeks. Been having trouble sleeping. 
Got my ass chewed for dodging leadership. Told to see a counselor. Went. I'm fine. Just a couple more weeks here. F this. F Ouija boards man. This is stressful enough. I don't need a haunting. Took a shower while writing this. No one else in the head. Lib just dropped. Most everyone in the line to leave. I didn't. Swore I heard something say my name. Problem. I heard my first name. No one says your first name here. Submariner here. There are few things as unnerving as being alone in the engine room from 23.30 to 5.30 during watch duty. When the boat is largely shut down in port, it becomes a very quiet place. The roving watches usually rush through their hourly log rounds, especially in the lower levels. During one particular in-port period, the boat was moored in Pearl Harbor and a few people started complaining about feeling uneasy. I was on the mid-watch as the SEO in the evening, and a senior chief came back to do his required three-tour. We saw him walk past maneuvering on his way to Shaft Alley. This particular senior chief was the crusty old salt type and he would usually spend some time just sitting in the lower levels of the engine room alone, contemplating life, so we expected as much. What we didn't expect was for him to literally run into the maneuvering area a few minutes later. The man was pale-faced and breathing heavily. We sat up straight, our eyes as wide as his, thinking we were about to announce and fight some ship casualty. He slumped into the EDO chair. A few tense and silent moments passed. We were on pins and needles. Finally, he opened his mouth and told us about the ghost in Shaft Alley. He swore that a sailor passed by him as he was sitting on a trash can in Shaft Alley. His first response was to call out to the guy, to see who it was. But then he realized this guy wasn't dressed right. He described what this guy was wearing, the old World War II naval uniforms. So he quickly got up to catch up to the guy, and he did. He caught up to him all the way aft. The guy turned towards the senior chief, looked right at him, then turned away and literally walked through the ass end of the boat. It was at that moment the senior chief decided it was time to leave Shaft Alley, and promptly did so. He swore up and down that he knew what he saw. I sure as hell wasn't about to leave maneuvering that night to find out for myself. It was between 12.30 and 1 a.m., on the morning of April 23, 2012, when a man heard an odd animal sound coming from outside. The sound was a level growl or screeching sound that he listened to for about five minutes. The sound seemed as though it was just outside the window. The witness, intrigued by the odd noise, awakened his wife to see if she could recognize what type of animal it might originate from. When his wife got up and they both heard the sound, she looked out the window across the road to a creek about 15 to 20 feet away. She then noticed what she thought was a deer standing up in the middle of the creek. Her husband questioned why there would be a deer standing in the creek, and why it be making such a strange noise. He then looked out the window and saw an undetermined creature dark brown in color and about the size of a deer. It could have been actually larger than a deer if it was peering over the retaining wall. The fellow said when it turned its head, it appeared to have an elongated face, almost deer-shaped, but not a stubby in the snout. It appeared to be more pointed in shape. What could be easily seen were two big round amber-colored eyes that seemed to be glowing. The man estimated that they looked to be the size of a golf ball. He didn't think that they were reflecting as a result of some street lights some distance away. The witness commented that the freaky part was it was starring right at their house towards them. The couple noticed that whatever it was, the glowing eyes were staring directly in their direction. The man told his wife he was going out to check out what it was. Just then something very strange occurred. Suddenly the creature took one step, and took off into the sky at a 45 degree angle and was gone. The witness stated, the speed was insane. I never saw anything move that fast. He also stated that he never saw a bird that big and that he saw no signs of wings flapping.
During a deployment to South America my SFA team encountered what I can only describe as a stealth-like hunter alien with dreadlocks. He killed us off one by one in the most efficient effortless manner. Keep in mind we were all seasoned operators out of Fort Bragg, pretty much all sexual tyrannosauruses. My CO was the only one who made it out alive after engaging the enemy in hand-to-hand -hand combat but eventually getting to the chopper. I have to preface this to provide context, and I'm tired and on my phone so this may be messy and kind of long, so I apologize. At the time, I was working nights in the munitions storage area, which is fenced off with barbed wire. The whole area is pretty spread out, with multiple buildings, and definitely large enough that you generally drove around to get to other buildings. Due to the nature of the job, the buildings are spread out with clear space between them. Anyways, the only people in the bomb dump on this night are roughly eight of us in my shop, and one guy in control that night. He was in another building, and we had a direct line to him on what we called the bat phone, relevant later. This is summer in SC, around 2 or 3 AM, so the air was warm and very still. There was no breeze at all, and we had the break room door open while we watched a movie, we were on flight line support standby, and nothing was going on. Now, the rumor was the small building we worked out of had been built by German POWs during the war, and I know for a fact that there were some there back then. It was small, with a main break room, a small dispatch office through a doorway, and a couple of offices off of that one. There were two doors, one in the break room and one on the same side of the building in the dispatch office, roughly 20 to 30 feet away from each other. Both had push bars on the inside, but only the break room door could be opened from the outside, as the dispatch door's external latch was busted, and only the internal bar worked. Well, all of us, minus the guy locked down in the control building, for security, are in the break room when suddenly ka thunk, loud as shit, from the dispatch door in the next room. It was like someone was rushing through, slammed the push bar, and the door swung open then swung back shut after a couple of seconds with a slam. We all looked at each other like WTF? And started to check it out. We had mag lights in our crew books, so a few guys grabbed them and swept around the building from both directions, another guy called the controller on the bat phone, who picked up and denied that he was messing with us. There was no way he could have messed with us and made it back to his phone in time, let alone doing it without being seen or heard. Anyone with experience knows how sound carries at 3 AM in the SC summer. You could hear the beeps from code keys being pressed hundreds of yards away, no joke. There was no way he could have hoofed it back to his building anywhere near fast enough, gone through the halls, punched in his code, and got to the phone in time. But the thing that got me was that damned bar. The door simply did not open from the outside, and we all heard that bar get pushed in hard the door swing open, hang there for a couple of seconds, then shut. And there was absolutely no breeze, and had there been, it would have blown past you as sitting in front of the only other door. Weird. As an aside, there would be random times that I would go to pick up a trailer or something behind one of the other shops at the far end of the bomb dump, and as soon as I stepped out of my truck to do my inventory, I would get a super bad vibe. I'm talking the heebie-jeebies like no other, and as best I can describe it, it felt like something was right above and behind me, and just hated me being there. Just seething anger, rage, and hate, and it wouldn't go away until about 15 minutes after driving away from that building. One night, another driver who had arrived there shortly before I had for a trailer asked if I had a weird feeling there, which sure as shit I did, so I know at least once someone else corroborated it. All of this was on the mid-shift, which was 11 to 7.30 am I heard a few other people's stories about weird shit that would happen at night, but since they aren't my stories, I can't vouch for their veracity. The only other thing that happened to me there was I swear I caught the clear silhouette of a guy walking in an open field between igloos. As I turned to punch my gate coat in, in the corner of my eye, I distinctly caught the motion of two legs and an arm sticking out like someone mid-stride. 
When I turned back, it was just an empty field. That one could have just been my mind playing a trick, but man, that place could be creepy. It's been damn near 15 years, but still gives me chills to think about. Story happened to girlfriend's dad in 1975 on the border of Lithuanian SSR and Latvian Soviet Socialist Republic. So at the time there was a project called to go collect potatoes basically, take spoiled college kids, send them to do some labor on farms to get them some hands-on experience. This happened to girlfriend's dad along with classmates, and they were sent an extremely rural, backwards area on the border of Lithuania SSR and Latvian SSR. So girlfriend's dad befriends another student sent, who actually was from this region. Instead of actually doing the labor, they instead, spend this time doing hikes, exploring, camping etc. One day, they go hiking into the woods, and go deeper and deeper, it starts to get dark, and they comes across a very old homestead, lights are on inside, so they think maybe was can crash here and they knock on the door. So they knock on the door, and an old man opens the door, he said oh you have arrived, I've been waiting for you, which is a polite way of saying come in. So they enter the house, instantly they noticed the house was filled with skulls, bones etc, weird, but could be hunter. But then they enter another room and there is a great feast, all set up, extremely lavishly, like a wedding according to friend's dad. The vibe apparently got very weird, very quickly, the old man said for them to join the guests and eat. The friend, who was a local to the region, apparently had some idea what was happening and told them they need to leave immediately, and so they got the hell out of there. That's all we know of the story so far, girlfriend is trying to get some more information about this story. Any idea what this feast was? The general tone is that this guy was some form of old pagan witch. What makes this also very interesting is that this was Soviet era, so definitely some underground thing. Edit. So got some more about the story from parents, the feast according to the friend, was called a ritual of calling, these events happened around September to October, and the region was called Plotile. The friend also called this man a witcher. So I would like to start this off by saying two things. One being if you have already started reading this please finish because I want to know if you have had a similar encounter, and two being that I don't intend to be rude whatsoever, I just don't care if anyone believes me or not. I know it would likely be hard for anyone to read an encounter story and instantly buy it, but I don't know how to state that I am not lying or over exaggerating any detail of this, every moment has been stained in my mind. So. With that being said I'm not going to go off on any tangents ABT why you should believe me, so let's start. About a two years ago, I was 13 almost 14 at the time, was still quite immature for my age, and enjoyed role playing as Mortal Kombat characters, fighting with my little brother who is now almost 13. By the way I live in Whitefish Montana, near a place called Olney, surrounded by woods pretty much. I also have horses basically everywhere on our property, is important info for later. Anyways, me and my little brother decided to go outside to the back of my house where there is a road that is about 400 feet in length leading up to I would say about 8 round hay bales, to pretend to fight each other with wooden swords we had custom detailed and made ourselves. I was cosplaying as Sub-Zero and my brother was just wearing regular clothes, and we started walking away from our house towards the hay bales because we intended to fight on them. Once we had gotten ABT halfway there which took like a minute, we were almost at the end of our horse pen that was fenced in next to our house reaching out halfway to the bales. I remember my brother leaning down to tie one of his shoes that had a messed up lace on the right one and I am gonna get straight to the point as too many details ABT anything but what we both saw still makes me very nervous and sweat. I looked over at him and immediately heard a loud trampling or sprinting sound coming from the hay bale area. I looked up and at them, and I saw what I thought to be something resembling a human but was extremely tall, the hay bales were stacked two up, and I think four across, 
It was grayish white and ran behind the bales in what I assume a pretty much straight line, then going past them and disappearing into the woods that went from behind the hay all the way around my house, besides the main gravel road that brings you to the highway of course. I immediately freaked the F out, and tried to yell to my brother right beside me but only managed to basically talk super fast to him with an inside voice. He as well looked up very quickly because he had heard the running too. There was a small pause where my brother sounded confused, and the right as he did it came back running to the hay bales once again, stopping this time behind the third row, of two stacked on one another. It was so tall that we could both see almost the entirety of the thing's head, and then it ran kinda forward a little bit and then straight back towards the woods, never to be seen again. I want whoever that is reading to this point to know that this all happened in the span of about 5 to 8 seconds, and saying that whatever this was was running is a complete understatement. It had to be running at least 40 miles an hour, or fast enough where we could both barely make out what it looked like in detail, just the overall appearance. It looked to me as kinda like the rake but way taller and more slender looking and gray. I remember my brother yelling what the f and literally so do I as we full on bolted back to the house in probably 15 seconds. I got there first, yanked my brother in the door and slammed it harder than any other door I've slammed in my life, locking it. Of course, my parents didn't believe us at all, even though I was on the verge of either tears or a heart attack from the adrenaline. They said it was probably a moose. Hopefully I will get better answers here than from them but if not then that's okay I guess, and to be honest, I really do hope people believe me. It feels like a dream thinking back on it, just as it did the day after the incident. It's weird that I remembered this again suddenly today while watching a military crawler horror story on YouTube, probably because my mind blocks it out as a false memory or dream, even though I have a second eyewitness. If my brother wasn't with me I doubt I would ever believe what I saw. I was 18, 19 years old, a male if that matters. I was staying at my Mormon grandparents home with them, my uncle, and aunt living there. I slept on the couch. I was sitting on the sofa chair watching TV when what I thought to be a mosquito landed on me, so I immediately smacked it. I noticed the mosquito hadn't been squished, and for some reason, I felt compelled to pick it up and take a closer look. To my surprise, it had a human-like face, legs, arms, hands, feet, and an evil-looking gray color. I immediately showed my uncle and grandma. They both agreed that my grandpa needed to see it, so I put it in a Ziploc bag and zipped it closed. I also took a picture of it on my phone. Later. When my grandpa got home, I was ready to show him, but there was nothing in the bag, and my grandma and uncle were acting as if it never happened. The picture was gone also. I forgot about that night until a few months later, and now I am sharing it. Throughout all of it, and even now thinking of it and talking about it, makes me feel uncomfortable and afraid. They are evil, at least these ones. I'm not necessarily religious or was at the time, but I believe there's a God. I hope I don't sound crazy. I was just tidying my room and out of the corner of my eyes I saw what I thought to be a very tiny dragonfly. This wouldn't be uncommon in my room because my bedroom windows face a creek and I often find dragonflies in and around the house. Being curious like I am, I switched my lights on to get a good look and it was gone, I looked everywhere for this dragonfly, behind the curtains I saw it flying towards, moved furniture around, I went crazy trying to find this dragonfly and it was just not there. What has me wondering about it possibly being a fairy, is the way it was flying super close to the ground and as soon as I looked at it, it just vanished. My bedroom windows were all closed at the time so if it was a dragonfly it couldn't have escaped and I think I would have found it again with all the searching I did. I'm going a bit crazy over it cause I can't find this supposed dragonfly in my room and now I'm dead curious to know what I saw. In the summer of 2022, my last camping trip with my family, we went to a popular camping location in Ohio. 
If you can figure it out, bonus to you. My sister and I me, 17 at the time, and her, 14 at the time, shared a tent so we stayed up giggling and messing around quite a bit like Uno or talking about boys she liked. Mostly for week 1 and the 2 week trip it was fine, we slept and talked like normal. Until the second week where things took a turn. I have a really hard time with sleeping so when week 2 strolled around my sister would be passed out asleep and I'd be sitting wide away for hours at a time. While these hours where I sat awake I heard noises, crunching, shifting, growling, howling. The basic outdoor noises. For the next two days of week two I heard a lot of walking and talking in the woods, things like come here or help me sometimes I'd hear faint whispering near my tent. I was honestly scared shitless. On the last two nights which probably had been the worst, my sister was awake, both of us playing Uno with her phone dead and mine on a cool 20%. Around maybe 2 am my sister went to lay down and so did I until I heard thick footsteps around the tent. Too heavy for deers or wolves but too light for bears or elk. It was almost like a person was walking around my tent. My sister was awake and quietly watched as someone or something pressed on the tent sides and door. Now my sister and I move all the little tent zippers into our tents at night to keep people from trying to get in. Clearly this person or thing was looking for said zippers. So we felt pretty smart. This was night 4 of week 2. Now finally week 2 night 5. The same heavy footsteps the same touching at the walls and the same whispering to come here and come out. My scared booty waited until 5 am where I sat outside waiting for my grandma. While sitting out I heard whispering and then screaming, the scariest most blood chilling scream in the world. It sounded like some kind of animal or person or something, but it was so loud I nearly peed myself. I was glad we left and even happier to not go back for two years. Does anyone know what this is? Or if it was some dude lurking on our campsite? Update 1, talked grandparents and they said tater tot their little American shepherd at the time has been snarling at something outside the tent walking around, whatever it was got scared and let out a husk growl and ran away. It was about 3 am for them and it scared them. I apologize for the late update I was asleep. This story takes place about a year and a half ago, so my mind is a bit fuzzy, but it was one of the most strange and weirdest events I've experienced. At the time of this story, I was a freshman in college. I am a very introverted person and have only made a few friends throughout my time in college, about three or four. Also, at the time, I had a bit of a fishing phase where I loved fishing. I still do, but at the time, I loved to fish almost every day. I only really fished for common freshwater fish, bass, sunnies, a few catfish, etc. I was looking to go for something bigger. I was looking to catch carp. My college campus does have a lake and stocks it for students to fish from. My school isn't near a gas station, shopping center, or anything of the sort, so I couldn't just walk to get fishing supplies, and I didn't have a car either, so I was really only dependent on what I brought from home. Carp are also very sloppy fish, so they will eat just straight up food, anything that can produce a pungent odor, so I would just get some food from the dining hall, and whatever I didn't finish, I would fish with. Carp also prefer wet, sticky, rainy, or overcast weather and are more active during the darker parts of the day. I sat in my room board around 6 37 ish when I started hearing raindrops on the window. I didn't immediately go straight to fishing, rather, I just went to the dining hall at dinner and came back with leftovers to retrieve my rain jacket, boots, and fishing gear. I was taking my time, so by the time I arrived at the lake, it was about 8. Now, this lake is a pretty modest size, you could see probably 90% of it regardless of where you stand. Three quarters of it is bare grass where a walking path walks by while the remaining bit is trees and other brush. I stood on a bank and threw my line in the water. Leaning against a tree, I couldn't go on my phone because of the rain, so my attention was focused on my line until something caught my attention. I spotted a person, 
or at least what I assume to be a person, right on the outer edge of where the trees and brush begin. Now it was a rainy night, and street lamps don't stretch to where they were standing, so take what I say with a grain of salt, but they were wearing light white colored pants, a big black sweatshirt, and no shoes, just what appeared to be socks. They were standing in a very marshy, swampy area as well, I should mention. If they weren't getting completely soaked from the head down with rain, well, they were getting soaked from the feet up with mud. There was also some black box with a small white light coming out of it, which pierced through the night insanely bright, though it was a very small light, I'd assume a quarter inch big from where I was standing, but the amount of power it had was incredible. They would walk back and forth from the edge of the lake, look at the lake, and skip or dance back behind a tree multiple times, all the while picking up this small cube and pointing the light in the direction of different areas, going back behind the tree, revealing at the lake's edge, skip back behind, reveal themselves to move the box, go back behind the tree, and do this all over again. I watched them do this multiple times, making my presence known by making noise and such, but at this point, I was more entrenched by them rather than my fishing. It wasn't until they went back behind the tree, this time walking normally, stayed behind it for an uncomfortable amount of time before walking slowly to the lake's edge and, like they had a sixth sense, looked directly at me. However, from the only light emitting on them, I could only see a metallic shiny silvery sheath covering their entire face. No holes cut out for eyes or mouth. You may think it could be a clear face protector, but I saw what I saw. They stood there, almost staring into my soul for about 30 seconds, not once did I look away, I don't even think I blinked. But they turned, and I saw them walk into the brush, leaving that small cube on the ground, and they walked down to what I assumed the walking path which would have led down to the trail I was standing on. I went to my tackle box and grabbed my pocket knife from my pocket hoping I wouldn't have to use it, though I didn't know I wouldn't have to, as I felt that light shine on my face from the cube, I immediately looked up and it was facing me. I had had enough. I packed up everything quickly, and as I was walking back towards my dorm, I heard manic footsteps, very much bare footsteps. I ran back the staircase leading back to the main campus but not without looking down the foot trail. I saw what was my final look at that figure, they were sprinting in the opposite direction of me with their arms up in the air, not screaming or anything. I got back to my dorm safe and sound. Nothing happened the rest of the night, but I returned to the lake early the next morning before my classes, and I found what appeared to be horse hoof footprints though very exaggerated points on the top, in the shape of a bloated V. I saw the wear in the grass the thing left going back and forth behind the tree. I didn't find that black box either. Normally I would say that this may be some drunk or high student, but that doesn't explain their extremely weird behavior, those weird footprints in the drying mud, or that shiny face that pierced my soul. I'm not sure what I met that night, but I'm not sure I want to know. Pretty quick but basically he has this story that one time him and his friend were driving in Elkton, Maryland on a road. This was a good 25 plus years ago. Then 5 seconds later they were on the other side of the canal in Delaware. Which was about 30 minutes away from the road they were on which made no sense. They looked behind them and the road was just covered in dust like a dry dirt road. They both were not drinking or doing drugs. Both had the same recollection of that happening. Both agreed it made absolutely no sense they were here. And both actually went to therapy for it for a short time. But nothing ever came of it. My dad has this story he always says that when he was about 10 to 12 years old. They were en route 13 in Dover, Delaware which is home to Dover Air Force Base. But about 40 to 45 years ago him and his parents were driving, and there was about 20 plus cars all stopped on the road. Getting out their car and looking up to which looked like the Batmobile just floating there stationary, for a minute or two. And then just flew off. 
Everyone insisted it was a UFO but cameras weren't really a thing at the time I guess. My grandparents said they could confirm it happened and a bunch of witness saw it too but the witnesses were strangers at the time and they couldn't find any newspapers or anything about it anywhere. Wondering if anyone out there knows about it this too. Could have been the Air Force Base aircraft but the way 20 plus random cars were parked on Route 13 along with him and my grandparents all starring in shock makes it interesting. So around 2007 to 8 placing me around 5 years old possibly 6. I was still in one of those transforming cribs with a portions that could drop down and turn it into a toddler bed. This left the bed rather high off the floor. At the time I lived in southern Arizona. Late in the night very early stages of the morning 0 to 3. I was awoken by something grabbing at my ankle feeling long sharp nails. Like stiletto style nails from the now fragmented memories I still have of the night the thing looked like a stereotypical witch. Wrinkled wart riddled face with long nose and rotting teeth. It never spoke but did manage to pull me off my bed and under it. It startled me understandable so. It put a single finger up to its lips in the shushing motion. It never changed and simply vanished from sight as the sun began to rise. I guess I was so freaked out I never spoke about it. It wasn't some weird dream based on a memory as at the time I wasn't a huge fan of any media with witches and was a pretty hard set Lilo and Stitch kid already. I'm reaching out to share a peculiar and unsettling series of events that have left me searching for answers, and perhaps more importantly, for others who might have experienced something similar. It's a story of days so anomalously bad that they defy simple explanation, marked by a series of technological failures and personal challenges that seem to transcend mere coincidence. Just over a year ago, I experienced a day that was unusually disruptive. Despite starting the day with a positive mindset and no anticipation of trouble, everything began to go awry. My work with technology, which is usually within my control and goes smoothly, suddenly became a nightmare. Specifically, my cluster's nodes began to DDoS each other, leading to a cascade of breakdowns. Attempts to engage in ordinary coding resulted in failures where none should logically exist, code that worked flawlessly the day before simply stopped functioning. Efforts to address these issues only compounded the problems, turning the day into a series of escalating technological crises. This day was notably peculiar, not just because of the technological anomalies, but because it seemed to actively counteract every attempt at productive work, leading me to eventually cease all efforts and resign myself to doing nothing. The day's conclusion was marked by a personal tragedy, the sudden death of my brother under very distressing circumstances. Fast forward to exactly one year later, without any prior recollection of the date or anticipation of trouble, I found myself once again ensnared in a web of unexplainable difficulties. Attempting to retrieve an important video, I accidentally formatted the DVR, a mistake that is uncharacteristic of me given my meticulous nature with technology. This was followed by over 12 hours of unsuccessful recovery efforts, a botched attempt to fix shades, and a myriad of other issues that seemed to compound, echoing the chaos of the year before. It's this pattern of recurrence, happening precisely one year apart, that has compelled me to seek understanding and shared experiences. On both occasions, my approach to the day was marked by a willingness and readiness to work, unaffected by any prior expectation of difficulty. Yet, the unfolding of events seemed almost scripted in its capacity to derail productivity and peace of mind. I'm reaching out to this community to ask, have any of you experienced similar patterns of recurring difficult days, where the array of challenges faced seems beyond statistical coincidence or psychological expectation? How do you interpret or deal with such days? This isn't just about seeking explanations, it's about finding solidarity and perhaps a way to navigate or mitigate these occurrences. Any insights, theories, or personal stories you're willing to share would be greatly appreciated. Thank you for taking the time to read my story.
I look forward to any thoughts or shared experiences you might offer. Hello everyone, I've always wanted to post my story here, but I'm not very articulate so I haven't done it until now. I want to tell my story because hopefully it can stop young girls or boys from being harmed. By the way my name is Sarah. So when I was 17 years old my family and myself moved to a new area which meant I had to quit my old job. I always wanted to work to be able to support my coffee and shopping addiction so I was very eager to find a new job, but this time I wanted something that paid more. I thought I was way too smart to accept minimum wage so I started applying to be a receptionist at some vet clinics in the area and some other lower level receptionist jobs. I don't know why I thought I would be able to get a job like this while in high school, all I can say is I was an ambitious kid. I was on Indeed and would also drive to locations to fill out applications, but I wasn't getting any call back so I became frustrated and turned to Craigslist. My mother told me over and over again to not go on that website and I watched the Craigslist killer movie, I knew how stupid this was, but I was 17 so I thought I was invincible. I applied at a few more receptionist jobs and vet clinics that I made sure were reputable places. I received one call regarding my Craigslist applications. It was from a man who sounded very professional and told me that he had just started a company and needed a receptionist which already sent red flags off in my mind because I had not filed out an application for any new companies. I asked him what the name of the company was and he dodged my question, but I was still very interested. I wanted to make good money. He told me that I had a really nice voice which I thought was good because if I was going to be working as a receptionist I should have a good phone call voice, he also said that I was beautiful which I blushed at at the time. He told me that he would love to meet for an interview that day and I was very excited. I grabbed a pen and paper and asked him where his company was and he said they hadn't moved into their building yet which was a little strange, but I said no problem where would you like to meet. They'll have my mom drive me and he started to act a little off when I mentioned my mother. He said no need to bother your mother it'll pick you up. That sentence was the point where I knew I was talking to a bad guy but I still tried to reason it in my head because I really wanted this job. I had been applying for months and this was the first call I received. So I said to him no that's okay my mom will drive me, she wouldn't want me getting into a car with a man I don't know. And that's when he started telling me that the only way we could do it is if he could pick me up. He started getting annoyed and said that there were so many women applying for this job so he needed to get an answer as soon as possible. He also started telling me all the opportunities I would be missing out on. At that point I was very conflicted and asked if I could give him a call back in a moment and he sighed and said yes, but don't make me wait. I hung up the phone and was relieved to be done with that conversation. I went to my mom's room and explained everything to her and she lost her mind. She said, Sarah that guy is some pervert don't call him back. And then she proceeded to look up the police station number because she wanted to report him to the police. I was embarrassed and begged her not to. He proceeded to call me over and over again after I hadn't responded. I didn't want to talk to him again so I texted him and said no thank you to the offer. He lost his mind. I received so many text messages along the lines of dumb bitch I have so much money I could have taken care of you I know where you live act. For weeks after this incident I felt so guilty because I thought I put my entire family's life in jeopardy. I had a hard time sleeping and I rejected any interviews immediately because I thought they could have been him using another person to bait me out of my house. I wish I would have allowed my mom to call the police because I think he was going to do something really messed up. I sell everything from car parts, cars and tools to appliances and collectibles on Craigslist, so I get a mix of people that nobody wants to imagine. A few highlights would be me selling a car that I told the guy overheated and shut off after running for 5 to 10 minutes. We left it to idle while we talked, he asks for a test drive around the block and I said okay. Now, he had come with another guy with a truck and who hauled dolly which we agreed to unhitch and put in a spot that it couldn't be quickly rehitched so that he could load the car and go. Keep in mind, 
This was an 80s Camaro with a full straight pipe and no plates. I watched the test driver hauling us down the hill while trailer guy sat in his truck, and truck guy picked up his phone, and then sped off. Keep in mind, he didn't have the trailer. Long story short, the Camaro broke down at the end of my street after the driver tried to run off with it, and trailer guy left the trailer in front of my house, and due to their stupidity I took pity and returned the trailer to U Hall and didn't persuade it. The level of stupidity of trying to drive off in a car that the owner told you would break down as soon as it got hot is impressive. Another good one was the truck bed cap I was selling for a long bed ranger. The guy came to my house in a short bed ranger, paid me, we put it on, it was obviously too long, and he asked if he could borrow a sawzall. I let him, and he proceeded to hack the last 18 inches of it off, hand the saw back, shake my hand thank me and drive off. That was a new one. Other gems include people insisting that 8 lug Ford truck rims would fit on their vehicles that did not have 8 lug axles, my TV sales story somewhere else in the thread, a guy buying a rust free tailgate then coming bam with a rotted out one a day later yelling claiming that it was broken and rotted out and that I ripped him off, a few people showing up to my house and trying to walk off with things, and one guy who probably purchased an appliance off of me stealing the washer and dryer out of my truck while I ate lunch at Wendy's that were both broken that I was on my way to scrap. Oh Craigslist, how I love thee. On the buyer's end, I had a guy try to sell me a Honda Civic that had four different VIN numbers, and a very obviously swapped dashboard VIN plate. The car, when run on Carfax according to the dashboard, was a red 2002 Civic Coupe, Year may be wrong, I don't remember precisely, but the car was a 2001 grey four-door. It had all of the signs of a very obvious bad chop shop job, and was in a bad part of town. I told the police, and it was in fact stolen and I dodged a bullet. Sold an expensive fully tested aquarium light on Craigslist once $300 cash. Sweet. Email comes through guy would like it dropped off as he was a college student and didn't have a car. Being freshly out of college I sympathized and said sure he lived in Boston 45 minutes away. Not only did this mother f live in Boston, he lived on Newberry Saint in Boston the vestibule to his apartment complex had a crystal chandelier. But I digress. The buyer comes out and meets me and invites me in where he says he only has 200 bucks and asks if that's okay. I'm obviously pissed. He hits up his roommate for the extra Benjamin who puts out without a fight I am now onto his shit. I take my money and go collect my illegally parked car for this transaction, the only perk is I'm in the second nicest neighborhood in Boston. I haul my SUV the 45 minutes back to my house. No sooner do I get home and I get a text from this mother f, he wants me to come back to Boston to refund him because the LED moonlights on this aquarium light have burnt out. I tested it before posting and delivery LEDs worked fine. LEDs don't burn out magically. I'm a good guy, if I sold something that was damaged I would probably work something out with the buyer, but really? F this guy. I ignore this guy's message, mother F blows up my phone with texts for the next 3 days. 10 of 10 would tell him to go F himself next time. When I was 21 I tried to kill myself by taking half a bottle of Xanax and posting an ad to Craigslist asking for someone to come get me. Someone did. He took me back to his place and as soon as he gave me a glass of wine I knew something bad was going to happen, but I'd asked for it. Well, I hadn't asked for it but I'd made a CL posting saying I took a bunch of pills and need someone to get me. I was practically comatose and only vaguely remember, but he proceeded to date our me and beat the shit out of me. To be fair, I hated my life so much at that point I wasn't even mad. And to his credit, had he not kept me up all night raping and beating the shit out of me I might have died. At the end of it he threw me unceremoniously in a shower and showed me all the bruises and wealth he gave me before driving me home. I never pressed charges. I'm not even mad about it. But, 
I became aware of how messed up the people of Craigslist can be that night. Had he not saved my life, it would have been a complete horror story. Mine is just kinda sad. I adopted a dog, my first ever dog adoption, my husband has his own that he got long before we met. I'd spent a long time picking out the perfect dog from our local shelter and thought I'd found him. It ended up not working out, turned out he didn't like my cats despite being okay with the cats at the shelter, and it was causing a lot of havoc in our home as he couldn't be left alone anywhere near them. I reluctantly advertised him on Craigslist with a rehoming fee and was very picky about who I would let him go to. This woman emailed me a few times and begged me to hold him for her so she could meet him. I sent her photos and she said things along the lines of it was meant to be and finding him is a dream come true, you know, the kind of stuff overly enthusiastic dog lovers say about dogs. She clearly adored dogs so I agreed to hold the dog a couple more days so she could meet him. She cancelled the day she was supposed to come, but begged me to let her reschedule in two days time. I agreed, but let her know other people were interested. Two days passed and she cancelled again, spinning a story about her brother's car breaking down and her having to loan him money. I told her I couldn't hold him any longer but I appreciated her interest. All of a sudden she was on her way. She turned up at my house at around 11 pm and told me she would take him then and there, that she didn't need any time to see if they would bond as it felt right. He kept barking at her, which I found weird because he never barked, but she seemed over the moon about it. When it came to getting the rehoming fee she told me she didn't have it so we agreed that she would come by the following weekend once she got paid again. The day before she was due to bring the rehoming fee she started sending me texts accusing me of lying about him being house trained. I assured her he'd never gone to the bathroom in my home and that he actually seemed to only ever want to pee on my lawn mower and spring onions. I told her he was probably just adjusting to being in a new home with other dogs. She wasn't happy about my response, but I don't know what she wanted me to do. The day she was supposed to bring the fee over I got a knock on the door from the animal cops. She'd reported him as a found, stray dog, claimed he had bitten her after she had struck him. Zand he had been captured and was taken to be quarantined. His microchip had shown my address. I cried as the animal cops took my statement and I gave proof that she had in fact adopted him from me, not found him. They were pretty pissed off at her too at this point. He went to the shelter and passed his week in quarantine but, due to a mix-up or lack of organization, he was euthanized anyway. It broke my heart and I sent the woman a text letting her know what had happened. Her boyfriend responded with a drunken, immature comment and then I was bombarded by texts from her over the next couple of days, saying how awful she felt and how she couldn't sleep at night. The animal cops ended up filing a report against her for filing a false report to them about the dog, and she ended up being cited. So yeah, never again will I put an animal on Craigslist. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for daily stories. We at Horror Den of Misfits really enjoy this, and your support would be appreciated.